0233 hours local, and in a mountain complex in North Korea just over 100 miles from the Chinese border, technicians scramble to remove camouflage netting from the entrance to a deep underground bunker. That bunker has been cut into the mountainside and covered over with camouflage to fool American spy satellites loitering hundreds of miles overhead. The cover of night helps to obfuscate the rush of activity, and the heavy cloud cover is exactly what the Hermit Kingdom was waiting for. Out of the converted mineshaft, a huge truck is carefully backed out. The massive vehicle has only one purpose, to transport the equally massive Hwasong-50 intercontinental ballistic missile. Finally eased out of its hiding hole, the truck begins the laborious process of lifting the giant missile into position. Over 40 feet tall, the missile is taller than a two-floor home and has the power to destroy several square miles of a densely packed city. The launch command officer picks up a phone hardwired straight to an underground telephone line that's connected directly to Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans have to resort to primitive telephone technology to ensure the United States or its allies aren't listening in somehow. On the other end, the North Korean dictator gives a single word. The Hwasong-15 intercontinental ballistic missile fires its main engine, shaking the entire launch complex to its core. Launch personnel hide behind blast screens or huddle inside the relative safety of the launch truck's armored cab, hunkering down in case something goes wrong and the missile and its entire fuel load explodes. Two seconds later, the missile proves to be in good operation and lifts off the ground. A thousand miles above the Earth, the United States' space-based infrared system immediately detects the thermal plume of the massive rocket. A low-Earth satellite sends an immediate flash alert to the 2nd Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. Brother and sister units across the broad web of U.S. missile defense and the commanders of every U.S. geographical command. A second U.S. satellite in a geostationary orbit confirms the thermal signature of a large ballistic missile and chirps a second emergency alert. The massive Hwasong-15 is nearing supersonic flight and has punched several hundred feet through the clouds and into the open sky. The U.S.'s space-based infrared system satellites have now focused their full attention on the telltale thermal signature of the big rocket. Cloud cover may have made it impossible to see liftoff with the naked eye, but the incredible heat given off by the fiery liftoff was easy to spot by infrared sensors. Now the large rocket is screaming through the air, riding a thermal plume several hundred feet long and thousands of degrees hot. The U.S. satellites immediately begin to compare the thermal signature of the North Korean rocket with a large onboard library of known missile launches. In less than a second, there's a match with two different Hwasong-15 test launches from the late 2010s. The confirmed match is immediately sent to U.S. Space Command. U.S. Space Force personnel are stunned by the multiple threat warnings from the space-based network and rush to pour through the data. Humans are far slower than machines, though, and it'll take time to verify the threat. The North Korean missile is now twice as high as a commercial airliner, and its main rocket engine is still going strong. Space Force personnel have confirmed the launch as authentic. An emergency flash is dispatched to U.S. forces in South Korea and across the Pacific. It's impossible to know where the missile is headed this early in flight. Via hotline to the DoD and the White House, the alert is out. North Korea has fired a ballistic missile, possibly tipped with a nuclear warhead. The main engine on the Hwasong-15 shuts down as it runs out of fuel. The missile coasts for a brief second, traveling at several thousand miles an hour now in the upper atmosphere, before a series of explosive bolts just under three-quarters of the way up separate the first stage of the rocket from the second stage. A second later, the second stage engine fires, and the vehicle lurches forward as it prepares to exit the Earth's atmosphere. An aide rushes to interrupt a meeting between the President of the United States of America and the leader of a partner nation. There's no time for formalities, and the President is practically dragged out of the room so he can be informed. North Korea has launched a nuclear attack. Target is still unknown. The President immediately heads for the highly restricted and secretive situation room in the heart of the White House. From there, he'll be able to communicate with American forces around the world and defend real-time tracking data from various American assets. U.S. Space Command issues an order for radar installations in South Korea and Japan to begin tracking the North Korean launch. Sea-based Spy-1 radars on American naval vessels are networked into the massive surveillance effort tracking the North Korean missile. While boosting into space, the missile is at its most vulnerable, but the United States still lacks its capability to rapidly destroy a missile during this initial phase. With development on high-velocity projectiles and directed energy weapons, it's hoped that in the near future U.S. forces will be able to down a missile during this vulnerable phase. For now, though, all U.S. assets can do is watch and gather data which will help determine where the missile is headed and which missile defense assets to activate. With a nuclear threat confirmed, the United States Secret Service begins preparations to move the president to a secure and highly classified location. If the missile is aimed at the White House, the president has less than 40 minutes to vacate. U.S. terminal high-altitude defense batteries in South Korea, Guam, and Hawaii are activated. 
Their powerful AN-TPY-2 radars begin sweeping the sky for signs of the threatening missile. Designed to obliterate an incoming ballistic missile during its terminal phase, the batteries of the interceptors are currently useless and can only defend the areas they're assigned to. Patriot missile defense batteries in the U.S. bases across the Pacific go on alert. These two are short-range defenses which are only useful for defending specific locations. U.S. Aegis-equipped warships in the region are given the same alert. Their SM-3 missiles can also be used for short-range ballistic missile intercepts just outside the atmosphere, but require the target to be in its descent stage. With a range of several hundred miles though, each Aegis-equipped ship can help protect multiple U.S. installations or naval battle groups. The U.S. Northern Command at Peterson Air Force Base begins preparations to activate the United States' homeland defenses. At Fort Greeley, Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the ground-based mid-course defense system is activated, a collection of 44 interceptors. These missiles have a far greater range than either the Mobile THAAD or the Navy's SM-3 missiles and are designed to intercept a target in the mid-course before it's had a chance to enter terminal phase and is still cruising through space. More data is needed, however, and all that U.S. forces can currently do is watch and wait. It now has become clear from the missile's trajectory that this is not an attack against forces in South Korea or Guam. Japan is also ruled out as a target. Hawaii remains a likely target, but so does the rest of the U.S. mainland. The U.S. president is notified that based on the missile's trajectory and speed, it is not a test of a new missile. All the data points to this being a legitimate launch against American forces. Given North Korean capabilities, it's likely this is an attack against either Hawaii or the American West Coast. While North Korea has missiles capable of reaching the East Coast, it's not believed they have the targeting capabilities to strike that far with any sort of precision. The president authorizes the use of ground-based interceptors against the incoming threat and order the U.S. Navy ships near Hawaii or the American West Coast to move into positions to best protect major population centers. Across the United States, a fleet of specially modified aircraft put into the air. These big planes are loaded with communications gear and hardened against electromagnetic pulses. They're known as doomsday airplanes because it's their job to ensure that the President of the United States can remain in contact with all U.S. military forces even in the event of a massive nuclear strike against the homeland. The planes will fly high enough to avoid being caught up in destruction below and provide a direct airborne link between each other and surviving space and ground stations across the world. They will not come back down until the crisis is over, with a special fleet of aerial tankers dedicated to keeping them fueled and flying. For the moment, they settle into an orbital pattern across the West Coast, the East Coast, and the American heartland. The full might of the U.S. nuclear triad is officially on alert and prepared to retaliate against any potential threat. With the possibility of another nation using the cover of a North Korean strike to attack the U.S. with its own weapons, America from this point on has to be prepared to fight a nuclear war against any adversary. Troop recall orders are issued for American units across the world, informing soldiers they must drop whatever they're doing and immediately report for duty. Nuclear-capable aircraft are prepared for a possible nuclear mission, and nuclear munitions are prepared for possible loading and launch. Deep in the darkest recesses of the world's oceans, the American nuclear ballistic missile submarine fleet makes its own preparations to rain down apocalypse on the President's command. The second stage of the Hwasong-15 missile runs out of fuel. The payload detaches from the second stage and using a chemical-powered thruster adjusts its course and heading. The missile is now flying unpowered, riding the incredible momentum built by the massive two-stage rocket and moving as much as 4.2 miles a second. U.S. Space Command issues new tracking data on the North Korean missile and confirms separation of the payload from the second stage. Based on this new data, Hawaii is ruled out as a target. Current speed and elevation dictate that a hit on the southern American west coast is likely. Armed with this new data, U.S. missile defense personnel opt for a GBI launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base instead of Fort Greeley in Alaska. Four of the long, skinny missiles are activated and fed live targeting data, but they can't be launched yet. They must wait until the enemy missile draws closer before launching. The American president is rushed out of the Situation Room and two Marine One, his personal helicopter. Two attachés join the president. One carries the nuclear football, the remote nuclear command authority unit which gives the president the power to order Armageddon from anywhere in the world. The second carries a large backpack-like communications device that serves to keep the president in contact with all branches of the government and the military at all times. Rather than head to a predetermined shelter, the president opts to instead board Air Force One, believing that there's little risk to a full-blown nuclear attack on the homeland. From Air Force One, he'll be safe from the ground effects of a nuclear blast and be able to remain in contact with the rest of the military and government. U.S. and South Korean special forces stationed in South Korea and Japan are mustered and rushed to armories in preparation for a strike into the north. 
These elite units have been kept at high readiness due to recent hostilities from the north. Their specially modified Black Hawk helicopters can evade enemy radar and even fly more silently than any other helicopters in the world. They have one mission, infiltrate known North Korean nuclear sites and neutralize them from within. US and South Korean alert aircraft take to the skies in anticipation of a full-blown offensive from the north. On the ground, forces across the DMZ prepare for combat, and an alarm is sounded in Seoul. In case of hostilities, it's expected that North Korea will shell Seoul directly from behind the DMZ and has so many guns that it can deliver a whopping 10,000 rounds of high explosives per minute to the city of 10 million. American supercomputers calculate the trajectory, altitude, and speed of the North Korean warhead and feed that data to the ground-based mid-course defense system. With careful math, the computers calculate a firing solution and green light is given for the launch of interceptors. Four GBIs lift off from their silos in the California desert. The missiles will fly not to where the North Korean nuke is, but rather where it will be when they intercept it with a dumb kinetic warhead that will destroy the enemy nuke through sheer kinetic energy. As they lift into the sky, TPY-2 and sea-based radars are networked together and feed them a steady diet of tracking data. In Guam, Japan, and South Korea, air crews rush to their aircraft in anticipation of full-blown war with North Korea. First up will be F-15s and F-16s to establish air dominance. Normally, stealthy B-2 bombers would slip in behind the air superiority fighters to take out critical air defenses and communications nodes, but the bulk of the B-2 fleet is in Missouri and unprepared for combat. Instead, the Air Force's big stick, the B-52, is prepared for immediate action. These aircraft will require at least an hour to prep, but taking off from bases across the South Pacific will be able to put steel on target within the day. U.S. interceptors are now in space and speeding toward the calculated intercept point with the North Korean warhead. The interceptors have ditched their ascent stages and make only small corrections using chemical thrusters. If the calculated firing solution is bad, they could miss the North Korean warhead by miles. In that case, it'll be up to the Navy's Aegis vessels to down the warhead before it can strike an American city. Updated tracking data reveals the target is likely Los Angeles. The first wave of U.S. Special Operations Forces are given the green light from the American president to take off in their modified Black Hawk helicopters. Their destination is several North Korean nuclear launch facilities believed to be capable of rapid deployment. Other ground attack aircraft based in South Korea are already on their way to their targets, intent on destroying any ability for North Korea to launch a second attack. The U.S. President boards Air Force One. Upon arrival, he asks the United States Congress for a formal declaration of war with North Korea. The North Korean warhead suddenly breaks up into multiple smaller fragments as it ejects a cloud of highly reflective chaff. The metallic confetti is meant to confuse radar systems and make it harder to target the warhead. The warhead is now in eight pieces. Each piece could be a separate warhead or could be a decoy meant to lure missile defense systems away from the real warhead. U.S. ground and space-based radar struggle to pick out the real warhead from possible decoys from within the threat cloud. TPY-2 and sea-based X-band radars are best suited for this task, and it falls on them now to give a good intercept course for America's GBIs. Powerful processors churn through all the available data to sniff out the real threat from amongst the chaff and decoys. If they fail, millions of people will die. Using extremely precise measurements, the dummy warheads are singled out. Because of North Korea's inexperience with MIRV warheads and the use of decoys, the dummy warheads don't quite match the profile of a real warhead as perfectly as it flies through space. With a good intercept solution, the GBIs detach their exo-atmospheric kill vehicle. It will take six minutes for them to reach their target. There's nothing anyone can do now but pray. Unbeknownst to the United States, China has launched its own rapid response forces into North Korea. Elite Chinese troops penetrate North Korean airspace in fast transport helicopters. Their goal is the same as the Americans – seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal before it can be used again, and thus incur the wrath of the American nuclear triad. With both American and Chinese troops headed to the same objectives, though, this attack now has the possibility of sparking all-out war between the US and China. American EKVs scream through space at over 4,000 miles per hour. They're just seconds from a successful intercept or a catastrophic failure. The first EKV screams past the intercept point, missing the North Korean weapon by a dozen miles. The second EKV hits nothing. It too misses the North Korean warhead by over three miles. A second after the second EKV, the third strikes its target true, moving at a combined speed of just under 10,000 miles an hour. The impact produces a bright flash in the sky for a brief second. Nuclear detonation requires a precise chain of events, so the impact of the interceptor does not set off the nuclear explosion. Multiple ground stations and ship-based radar assets all confirm the good news. Two misses followed by a direct hit. The threat has been neutralized and the dummy warheads will burn up in the atmosphere. The American president receives the good news aboard Air Force One. He can still see Washington, D.C. out the left side of the aircraft. And despite this threat being over, he will not order a return to the White House. 
The conflict has just begun, and more nuclear attacks are possible at any minute from North Korea. On the ground half a world away, the South Korean and US armies are preparing for what will be the costliest war since World War II, a conflict that will make the original Korean War look like a cap-gun shootout. American warplanes are already en route to the Hermit Kingdom, preparing to drop tens of thousands of pounds of high explosives on suspected nuclear sites, and special forces from both the US and China are racing each other to seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal. On the border, the North Korean army is finally making its opening gambit, and over a thousand pieces of artillery begin to rain hell down on the South's defenders. The date is March 4, 2022, and after years of deliberation, both Georgia and Bosnia and Herzegovina have officially been accepted as full NATO partners. Ukraine now reinvigorates its push for NATO membership, while Russia has for the last six months warned of military action. Alarmed by what it views as encroachment of NATO on its borders, Russia at last responds to the ascension of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia by massing forces on its western border. Russia is gambling that the other NATO nations will reconsider admitting the two new members or at least not be willing to go to war over the defense of brand new members to the alliance. Russia, however, has completely underestimated the solidarity of the alliance, realizing that NATO is in essence a worthless entity unless Article 5 of the treaty is immediately enforced. NATO warns Russia that an attack on one ally is considered an attack on all allies. To reinforce the point, NATO troops are sent into Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the alliance's most vulnerable members given their direct proximity to Russia. Russia, however, sees this as an unacceptable show of force, and the move proves to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Without warning, Russian armor pours into Latvia and Lithuania, linking up with forces in Kaliningrad. World War III has officially begun. For the first month of fighting, Russian forces push as far west as Poland, but the offensive grinds to a halt as NATO members finish mobilizing and their resistance solidifies. With American troops and equipment making landfall in France and Germany, NATO is now launching vicious counterattacks against Russia's forces in Poland. In the Pacific, the American Navy steams towards Russia's eastern coast, bringing with it a Marine Expeditionary Force meant to open a second front in the war and split Russia's forces. Russia is faced with a losing proposition and decides to gamble. It authorizes a single nuclear strike against Berlin, betting that while European NATO members may retaliate with their limited nuclear arsenals, the Americans won't risk the destruction of their cities to support their European allies. The date is now April 12th, 0205 hours Zulu. American and Chinese infrared recon satellites both pick up the telltale fiery plume of an ICBM launch from a missile farm in the south of Russia. Two minutes later, the American president is awoken from his sleep and given the news. Russia has launched a single nuclear device, unknown payload, likely target in Western Europe. The US Air Force's Global Strike Command has for weeks been flying nuclear alert missions with its fleet of B-52 bombers, maintaining a nuclear armed force in the air 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, as its predecessor, the Strategic Air Command, once did for decades during the Cold War. With the detected launch of a Russian nuclear weapon, a priority flash is immediately dispatched to the airborne forces and alert forces on the ground. Flight crews stationed overseas in Japan, on the west coast of the United States, and in Europe all review their single integrated operational plan, which lays out the exact flight route, refueling track, and targets for each of the bomber crews. Most aircraft have two primary targets, with two alternate targets to be struck should they be unable to make it to their primary targets. Within minutes, the crews are in the air, and those already on alert patrols immediately set their course for the positive control turnaround point a pre-planned point near Russia where the air crews will automatically turn around unless they receive an order to strike. At missile sites across the American Midwest, the giant concrete shutters that protect the buried missiles inside their launch facilities are automatically rolled back, and the security forces personnel tasked with defending those sites go on full alert. Their orders are to defend the silos until every missile has been launched, after which they are to escort surviving missile crews out and back to a rendezvous point well away from the missile farm for these sites will be a priority target for incoming Russian missiles. Inside underground bunkers, missile operators rehearse launch procedures, each man responsible for a group of missiles. The entire system only requires two out of four of the operators to authenticate a launch order, just in case two of the men get cold feet about launching a nuclear Armageddon and refuse their orders. 
Deep in the Arctic, Pacific, and Atlantic Ocean, the US's extremely low-frequency communication system flashes a nuclear alert to America's ballistic missile submarine fleet. Each sub carries 24 Trident missiles, and each missile carries up to eight independently targetable warheads with a yield of 475 kilotons. America's fleet of hunter-killer attack submarines have for weeks been stalking and eliminating Russia's aging ballistic missile submarines, and the survivors are bottled up near the Russian shore where they can be protected with shore-based firepower and anti-submarine patrols. Now, America's attack submarines set course for Russia's coast, and their mission is to eliminate Russia's surviving nuke boats, though it will cost America's submarine fleet dearly as Russia's Air Force and Surface Navy fiercely defend their surviving ballistic missile subs. At 0209 hours, the American president is told that the American recon assets have positive confirmation of a nuclear detonation in Berlin. The Russians have fired an older, single warhead ICBM, yet with a yield large enough to completely destroy the city of 3.6 million. On a hotline direct with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the President is told that Britain is already issuing a fire order to retaliate for the attack. The President knows that the attack on Berlin was a gamble by the Russians, who don't believe that the US will risk an escalation and attacks on its own cities to defend Europe. An emergency flash is dispatched by the US's ELF communication system to a lurking Ohio-class submarine currently on station deep beneath the ice of the North Pole. After authenticating the order, the sub breaches through the five-foot-thick ice and the door on a single dorsally mounted launch tube props open. The navigation system on the Trident II missile located inside the launch tube is activated and a mission trajectory is automatically loaded into the flight computer. Then a steam generator ignites a solid grain rocket motor which feeds superheated exhaust into a tank of chilled water. The water evaporates and expands, forcing the missile within the launch tube to be launched upwards and out after which the first stage motor ignites and the missile screams upward and towards space. An astro-inertial guidance system on board the missile uses star positioning to fine-tune the accuracy of its trajectory, as GPS has long been unreliable due to Russian attacks on NATO satellites. The Russians have bet wrong, and minutes later eight 475 kiloton warheads detonate over the Russian missile facility which launched the Berlin attack. Simultaneously, a British attack strikes the cities of Ekaterinburg and Novosibirsk, with a population of 1.5 million or 3 million together. NATO has responded in kind to the Berlin attack, and America has both punished Russia's nuclear forces for the attack and shown that it will stand with its allies. In the halls of the Kremlin, a desperate power struggle plays out. 3 million Russians lie dead, and the US has obliterated one of Russia's major nuclear missile facilities, destroying dozens of ICBMs in place. Russian ballistic submarines, considered to be the most survivable element of the nuclear triad, have also been decimated by American attack submarines, though the US has lost 12 subs of its own in its quest to eliminate the remaining Russian boats. Military leadership clashes with the civilian leadership and demands a retaliatory attack on American missile facilities. With US reinforcements in force on the Western Front and Russia Russians starting to lose ground in Poland, battlefield commanders have for the last week been requesting a release on strategic nuclear weapons to use against American infantry and tanks. The fierce debate on the use of tactical weapons is reignited, and when further nuclear attacks are denied, Russian military leadership stages a stunning coup. The Russian president is removed from power, and Russian commanders receive authorization for the use of a dozen tactical weapons against NATO forces in Europe. Within a half hour, NATO troop concentrations in Poland are hammered by low-yield nuclear attacks, killing tens of thousands. American reinforcements fresh from the states and currently massing around the Rammstein military facilities in Germany are hit with three tactical devices. The Marine Expeditionary Force in the Pacific, staging out of Japan, is also struck by a single device, as are the two naval carrier battle groups supporting the invasion. By 9 am, American military forces have suffered more casualties than all wars since World War II combined, and the ability for NATO to push back Russian forces in Poland is eliminated. While Russia has maintained an inventory of low-yield tactical nuclear weapons to counter America's overwhelming conventional firepower advantage, the United States has not kept an active inventory of tactical devices for decades. This leaves the American president with few options for a comparable retaliatory attack. While the yields on America's airborne submarine and ground-launched nuclear devices can be dialed down, there's no way to broadcast that fact to the Russians, and little chance they'd believe it. 
An attack with traditional ICBM submarine-launched missiles or airborne nuclear cruise missiles will seem to Russia like a full-blown attack and risk escalating the war into a total nuclear confrontation. Yet the president has little choice. Tens of thousands of American service members are dead. US forces in Europe have been badly damaged by the attacks, and both carrier battle groups supporting the Pacific invasion are reporting major losses of ships, aircraft, and personnel. The Marine Invasion Force in Okinawa is combat ineffective, four divisions reporting over 55% casualties each. Resigning himself to a list of terrible options, the president orders a retaliatory attack using ground-based ICBMs. The Air Force's Global Strike Command nuclear bomber fleet is to approach and hold at their failsafe points, ready to proceed to their targets should Russia retaliate again. At Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, a launch order is authorized by the two-man Minuteman launch crew, and a single Minuteman III missile roars into the night sky. Sixty seconds later, the second stage of the missile ignites, separating from the spent first booster stage. Adjustments using the second stage thrust vector control keeps the missile on its course, and another 60 seconds later, the flight computer separates the second stage and fires the engine on the third and final stage. By now, the missile has reached space, and as the third stage engine burns out, reverse thrust thrust separates the three warheads and their penetration aids from the launch vehicle. Some of the penetration aids explode, showering space with millions of pieces of reflective aluminum, which wreak havoc on radar used by missile interceptors, while other aids simulate the real warheads and serve as dummy targets for any Russian interceptors. With no real Russian anti-ballistic missile defense programs though, the warheads and the dummies all re-enter the Earth's atmosphere completely unharmed. 23 minutes after launch, three separate 475 kiloton nuclear explosions rock Eastern Europe. Russian forces in Poland are obliterated by two nuclear strikes many times greater in magnitude than those used against NATO forces, while yet another Russian nuclear missile facility is struck by the third warhead. With American weapons targeting their missile fields and systematically eliminating Russia's ability to respond to nuclear attacks, the final order is given for a full-blown nuclear response. American reconnaissance satellites and electronic eavesdropping assets all pick up the telltale signs of preparatory operations for a nuclear launch across Russia's remaining missile farms. The order to attack is mirrored in the US, and launch officers in North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana receive the order to launch. Simultaneously, American airborne assets receive an emergency flash, which when authenticated authorizes the air crews to proceed to their targets with full nuclear release. American ballistic missile submarines breach through the thick polar ice, or rise to 25 feet below the waves of the Pacific in the North Sea. As Russian missiles clear their silos, it's America's nuclear ballistic missile subs which launch the first wave of retaliatory attacks, almost as fast as Russian ground forces. American submarine-launched missiles target Russia's remaining missile fields in a desperate hope to destroy them before they can finish launch operations, but for the most part, the American strikes fail to stop the launches. Secondary military targets are then struck, with major Russian military bases, supply depots, troop staging areas, and airfields all being obliterated in nuclear fire within 10 minutes of the start of the Russian attack. As Russia's ICBMs climb into the atmosphere, a wave of American ballistic missile defense systems immediately spring into action. Having spent billions on ballistic missile defense since the 1980s, all in a bid to make Reagan's Star Wars concept a reality, America now attacks the incoming missiles with a variety of tools. Airborne laser systems in Europe and flying in the Pacific manage to strike at a handful of ICBMs during their vulnerable ascent stage, superheating the missile body from hundreds of miles away with a powerful aircraft-mounted laser system. As the missiles climb into space, ballistic missile defense sites across the west coast of the United States launch their ground-based interceptors. Using a powerful radar, the interceptors scream toward the incoming missiles in a bid to destroy them through kinetic impact before they can re-enter the atmosphere. The Russian missiles, however, immediately disperse their own penetration aids, and a shower of billions of pieces of aluminum chaff wreaks hell on American interceptor radar. The interceptors switch to their visual interception systems, and advanced computer programs frantically scramble to identify the incoming warheads visually, ignoring the clouds of chaff. Half of the interceptors miss their targets, the other half manage to strike, yet of the successful intercepts, a full third are of dummy warheads. To make matters worse, the US only has an inventory of about 60 interceptors ready to fire and are completely overwhelmed by an incoming horde of hundreds of independently targeted warheads. 24 minutes after launch, the west coast is the first hit. One megaton strikes against Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, and others obliterate the most populated cities on the American west coast. A follow-on 450 kiloton strike destroys the Los Angeles Harbor area, along with tens of thousands of homes and the naval base at San Diego. 
Edwards Air Force Base in the California desert is struck by two 450 kiloton strikes, as is Vandenberg Air Force Base. Three minutes later, nuclear impacts strike the American Midwest. North American Aerospace Defense Command at Peterson Air Force Base is incinerated by a megaton blast, and the Cheyenne Mountain Complex is struck by two ground penetration munitions, though the blasts manage to do little damage to the deeply buried facility. Strikes continue to roll eastwards, and a saturation of 300 kiloton strikes decimates the American farm belt. These munitions are programmed to be ground bursts, resulting in the scattering of millions of tons of highly radioactive dirt across America's most fertile farmland. Another three minutes later and the east coast is struck by the Russian ICBMs. Washington is obliterated by two separate megaton blasts, as is New York City, the financial heart of America. The American president, however, is safe from the nuclear blasts. He has long ago boarded what is nicknamed the Doomsday Plane, an airborne command post from which he can still manage America's remaining military and civilian forces. With satellite and ground communications completely eradicated, a fleet of Air Force planes now makes up a global command and control system, linking up surviving military forces with the president. Soon, his plane will land at an intact airfield and he'll be helicoptered out to his surviving supercarrier, from which he will continue to command the survivors of America's military and oversee the reconstruction, if any possible, of what remains of America, all from the safety of the Atlantic Ocean. 24 hours before launch, Russia has threatened NATO to cease providing Ukraine with weapons and ammunition for weeks, and at last it's made good on its promise to take military action against any NATO convoys bringing such aid into the country. Just inside the Ukrainian border, a convoy of NATO vehicles is strafed by two Russian Su-25s. The unarmed transports are decimated by gunfire and rockets deployed by the Russian jets. There are no survivors. 23 hours before launch. Verification of the deserted convoy has finally reached the desk of the President of the United States. The convoy was being manned by Polish soldiers who'd help their Ukrainian counterparts unload American C-130s and pack up the much-needed war supplies inside of Polish territory. The shipment of modern weapons was safe as long as it remained outside of Ukraine, but immediately upon crossing the border, Russia declared it a legal military target. Now the President of the US has a very difficult decision to make and he immediately sets up a secure call with the heads of several NATO nations. 19 hours, 24 minutes before launch. Earlier in the war, NATO warned Russia that an attack on any of its convoys would constitute an Article 5 response. After a lengthy and heated discussion, the United States, Great Britain, France, Spain, Norway, Germany, and Poland all invoke Article 5 of the alliance. An attack on one is an attack on all. Other NATO members are being brought up to date as their leadership is being informed of the attack. Because the attack was not directly inside NATO territory, some members of the alliance, like Turkey, are having serious reservations. Two hours before launch. The United States, Great Britain, France, Poland, and Germany have all been prepared for the possibility of an attack by Russia, either into Poland or on Polish transports and logistics personnel assisting the Ukrainians. The five states decide to send Russia a strong message, and combat planes kept on alert for such an eventuality have been taking to the skies already for the last half hour. A massive lightning strike force of NATO planes is approaching various Russian military targets in Kaliningrad, Ukraine, and even along Russian borders itself, one hour, 18 minutes before launch. NATO planes overwhelm Russian defenses, who are completely unprepared for NATO's massive response. The attack purposely avoids striking Russian troop concentrations and instead lays waste to supply and fuel depots, runways, logistics hubs, and air defense sites. The Russian military giant has proved itself to be clumsy and inept in modern combat. And while a few NATO jets are lost to Russian air defenses, the attack is an overwhelming success. It's hoped that the attack will be enough to deter Russia from further aggression, and the targets were specifically picked in order to avoid large casualties for just this reason. NATO is still hoping to avoid all-out war with Russia, but the attack against a Polish convoy carrying NATO weapons simply cannot be ignored. 19 minutes before launch. Reports of NATO airstrikes have been rolling into Russia's general staff for the last hour and eight minutes. The attack was a complete and total humiliation for Russia, as its much vaunted air defense network was easily suppressed by a massive quantity of highly capable NATO planes. The resulting chaos has produced few military casualties, but opened up serious vulnerability gaps along the Russian border, inviting further incursion of NATO air power. Perhaps worst of all, it's shown that the nation cannot simply match the overpowering technological and doctrinal superiority of NATO's professional militaries. But the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, has been prepared for this. 
he has only one last card left to play. The only thing keeping NATO from absolutely steamrolling his forces in Ukraine and relegating Russia to a third-rate world power for the next century, nuclear weapons. Putin will send a message of his own. If he fails to, NATO will understand that it has near-complete impunity to attack Russia from the air by exploiting the gaps it created in its first assault along the Russian air defense network. An aide rushes over to President Putin carrying the Chiget, Russia's equivalent to the nuclear football. Much like the American version, the Chiget carries inside of it sealed authorization codes that relay President Putin's orders to his general staff. Putin selects his desired option and transmits the code to the general staff. The signal is uplinked directly to the Kafka's secret communications network that links the senior-most Russian leadership together. Verified as authentic by the general staff, which had already been gathered beforehand, the signal is then relayed directly to local weapons commanders. This is one of two ways for Russia to launch its nuclear arsenal, the second being its dead hand or perimeter system. This command system allows Russia to launch its nukes even if its entire senior leadership is eliminated in one sudden decapitation strike. Dead Hand was developed in response to US advances in submarine-launched nuclear weapons, which in the 1980s became capable of the precision required for a decapitation strike with only a three-minute warning thanks to the Trident D-5. Using a network of seismic light radioactivity and pressure sensors, Dead Hand can trigger a full-scale retaliatory response even if the entire senior Russian leadership is annihilated in one strike. To get the alert out, a specially modified ICBM is launched which carries a powerful transmitter instead of a nuke and relays a mass launch order across the entire Russian nuclear triad. 13 minutes before launch A single launch order has been relayed to an RS-12M1 Topol M ICBM unit. The road mobile launcher is harder to destroy in a first strike than ICBMs based on static missile fields, and this particular missile is based far in Russia's east, inside the Kamchatka Peninsula. The missile is already resting in an erected launch configuration, so it only takes a crew a few minutes to authenticate the order and make last-minute preparations for launch. When everything's ready to go, the launch order is given by the senior launch officer as the crew seeks shelter behind a rocky outcropping in case the aging missile experiences a launch failure. Russia's nuclear arsenal is getting into ever-worsening disrepair as the years go by, and the Russian Federation tries to live up to the old glory of the Soviet Union. Launch The cone at the top of the Tobol M container is blown off by a series of small explosive charges. Then the massive missile roars to life. The solid-fuel rocket shudders as its engine comes online and lifts the 104,000-pound missile into the sky. Even as it's lifting off, the missile's guidance computer begins to connect to Russia's GLONASS satellite network. It's guided by both the inertial guidance and GLONASS satellite uplink, giving it some of the greatest precision of any missiles in the Russian arsenal. Uplink to GLONASS is critical, as the Topol M isn't targeting a major city, which it could achieve with fair but not precision accuracy with only its inertial guidance systems. Instead, the Russian nuclear missile is targeting an American carrier strike group currently in transit south of Japan. Russia aims to teach the US a lesson with the only weapon it can effectively bring to bear against its military superpower. 15 seconds after launch Just 15 seconds after launch, a satellite belonging to the United States space-based infrared system detects the massive thermal signature of a large rocket lifting off into the sky. US early warning satellites have been extremely good at detecting missile launches and have even been used to track the launch of much smaller cruise missiles in Russia's conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. The massive Topol M rocket lights up the early warning satellite's thermal sensor like a blowtorch in the middle of a blizzard. The satellite immediately links up with multiple American Milstar satellites and sends a flash alert to the second space warning squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado, as well as other units across the entire web of the US missile defense. 25 seconds after launch Punching through cloud cover, the eyes of multiple American early warning satellites are picking up the telltale thermal plume of a massive intercontinental ballistic missile. Internally, the satellites compare the thermal plume and other telemetry, such as speed, to positively identify the Russian missile as a Topol M. 30 seconds after launch. The Russian missile is now entering the upper atmosphere in a highly inclined trajectory. To watching satellites, this is indicative of a strike somewhere far closer to Russian shores than the American homeland. The missile is also moving in the wrong direction for a strike in the US, as in that case it should be moving north to fly over the Arctic Circle. 1 minute 15 seconds after launch The President of the United States has been made aware of the missile launch. America's space-based surveillance network confirms no additional launches. New telemetry also confirms that this missile is not being fired toward the American homeland. There is hope that this is simply a show of strength, an unannounced missile test with a dummy payload. 
However, the trajectory of the missile leaves Japan and the U.S. base in Guam under threat. One minute, 45 seconds after launch, an emergency alert is broadcast via Milstar satellites to every combat command and deployed carrier strike group around the world. Ballistic missile defenses are activated in Japan and Guam, as the Japanese Prime Minister is being alerted to the threat. However, the missile's trajectory makes it very unlikely that a strike is incoming toward the Japanese islands. Guam is a suspected target, but so is a transient carrier strike group even now crossing south of Japan toward the South China Sea for routine freedom of navigation exercises. If the strike is against the U.S. carrier, there are only minutes for it to prepare to defend itself against a nuclear attack. 2 minutes 33 seconds after launch, the gravity of the threat has been relayed to the transiting American carrier and her escorts. Orders are immediately given for the ships in the formation to begin to spread out and put even more distance than normal between themselves. This is so that a strike against the group may damage most of the ships but actually only sink a few. Three minutes after launch, jets are ordered to be cleared from the deck of the carrier and rushed below. It's a lengthy process to move a combat aircraft from the deck of a carrier to below decks via the massive aircraft elevators, and unlikely that more than one or two planes could be successfully transferred from a busy deck to below. But all attempts to minimize the loss of personnel and all valuable aircraft must be made. Any non-essential crew to the current threat is ordered to brace. Damage control teams are ordered to begin to assemble. Even a glancing blow will likely still cause significant damage to the ship. 3 minutes 22 seconds after launch. The carrier's Aegis-equipped missile cruiser begins preparations for a ballistic missile defense. Its powerful AN SPY-1 radar begins sweeping the skies above for the incoming threat, though for now the missile is still far outside of its detection capabilities. 6 minutes 41 seconds after launch. Nearly 7 minutes after launch, the Topolim missile separates the warhead delivery vehicle from the tree stage rocket. This now splits open in a cloud of chaff meant to confuse American radar, and four warheads are jettisoned. Only one of the warheads is real. The other three are cleverly designed decoys meant to lure in interceptors and allow the real warhead to hit its target. The Russian missile has been experiencing some difficulties to date, however. American electronic attacks against the GLONASS system as well as space-based radar satellites have forced the missile to rely largely on inertial guidance as it makes its way to the last known location of the carrier strike group. Given that the carrier now has increased to its classified top speed, estimated to be well over 30 knots, this missile's accuracy is decreasing by the minute. 6 minutes 43 seconds after launch, American space-based satellites blast the cloud of chaff hiding the three decoys and one real warhead with high-powered radar, as powerful computers crunch through the data to work to reduce the effect of electronic noise created by the highly reflective chaff. In a few seconds, they have the telltale signature of at least four warheads. Using classified sensor technologies, the American satellites attempt to discern the real warhead from the fakes by measuring very subtle variations in the four warheads. Luckily, the Aegis missile defense cruiser waiting below has numerous interceptors ready to defend the strike group. But time will be of the essence, and the task of intercepting a ballistic missile is still incredibly difficult. In testing under realistic conditions, U.S. missile defenses have had a spotty record to date. Another spot on that record today will mean the death of thousands and the loss of over $15 billion in military hardware. 8 minutes 33 seconds after launch. The warheads have only a short flight time in space due to the proximity of the launcher versus its target, which is adding to the difficulty in interception. Data is of the greatest importance in successful missile interception, and gathering data takes time, time which is officially about to run out. The warheads begin their terminal descent down into the atmosphere. The Aegis cruiser's powerful SPY-1 RAR lights them up from below. On the ship's deck, multiple SM-6 missiles fire off into the pre-dawn sky. A few seconds later, a second volley of missiles lights up, followed a few seconds later by yet a third. The cruiser is taking zero chances and maximizing its odds of successful interception with multiple volleys. If they fail, thousands of sailors will die. 9 minutes 55 seconds after launch. The ship's ANSPG-62 X-band radar illuminates the incoming warheads and helps provide terminal guidance to the SM-6 interceptors. The ability to directly network with both seaborne and space-based sensors allowed the Aegis cruiser to cut through most of the electronic noise caused by the massive cloud of chaff released as a countermeasure. There are still doubts about which warhead is the real target, and thus each warhead is assigned multiple interceptors. This increases the chances of targeting the right warhead but reduces the chances of successfully intercepting it. The crew holds its breath as the incoming tracks quickly merge with the ship's defenses. 10 minutes 5 seconds after launch. Closing in at a speed of 1700 meters a second, the first wave of interceptors managed to knock out one of the decoys with a near hit by the SM-6's explosive fragmentation warhead. 
The warhead suffers severe structural damage from the shrapnel and explosion and tumbles out of control at thousands of miles an hour, destroying itself in the lower atmosphere. 10 minutes, 9 seconds after launch, the second volley of SM-6 missiles failed to hit a single target. 10 minutes, 13 seconds after launch, the third volley of interceptors knock out a second dummy warhead. 10 minutes, 15 seconds after launch, 60 miles below the two incoming warheads, there is no way for the strike group's crews to know if they've knocked out a real warhead or only dummies. Orders have already been given for all to brace for impact, and damage control crews are on standby to immediately pounce on any fires or see to fixing hull breaches and flooding. 10 minutes, 20 seconds after launch, a massive fireball explodes 3,000 meters above the sea somewhere south of Japan. The massive explosion sends out a wave of electromagnetic and thermal radiation that temporarily overpowers satellite sensors. Gradually, the noise fades and these electronic eyes in the sky begin to frantically scan for signs of the strike group. The strike has been off by just over a mile, meaning that the carrier strike group has avoided the most lethal part of the nuclear attack. However, a massive pressure wave slams into the strike group and causes moderate structural damage. On the big carrier, most of the planes left on the deck even though secured by tie-downs are blown off and into the ocean by the hurricane gale winds smashing into the strike group. With crews ordered below decks, the initial release of radiation is largely harmless to the strike group's personnel. This is helped by the fact that the strike group was just outside the most lethal radius of the nuclear explosion. Despite this, numerous crew are killed across the strike group from the effect of the pressure wave. Several of the ships are flooding, but damage control crews are already on their way to enact repairs. Compartments too damaged for effective flood control are simply sealed off to keep the rest of the ship from also flooding. This dooms several sailors to a drowning death as their comrades make the impossible choice of trapping them inside flooding sections in order to save the ship. The Russian nuclear strike has effectively rendered an entire strike group combat ineffective, as the ships must now limp to the nearest friendly port for immediate repairs. Decontamination must also be undertaken even before the ships arrive at port and damage to the flight deck of the carrier repaired to make air operations impossible. However, things could have been far worse if Russia had used more than one missile, as they would in a serious attempt at sinking an American carrier and her accompanying escorts. The fact that Russian nuclear command and control systems as well as their space surveillance and guidance and even the missiles themselves are in great disrepair helped limit possible damage as well. Russian guidance networks such as GLONASS are very vulnerable to disruption, making Russian weapons far from precise. Despite only suffering moderate damage, however, Russia has just launched a nuclear weapon against the armed forces of the United States of America. A full NATO Article 5 response is now inevitable, as is a state of war against a greatly outmatched Russian Federation. Faced with the certainty of losing a war against superior NATO forces, President Vladimir Putin must now contemplate expanding the use of nuclear weapons to defend his hold on power inside the Kremlin and fend off NATO attacks. Yet, in the American White House, the President of the United States is now even reviewing options for a similar attack against a Russian military facility. The world stands on the brink of full-scale nuclear war in what might be the greatest and final conflict of the human race. As you look at the results in front of you, you start to wonder if you're going insane. Have you just made some silly mistake that's given you totally misleading test results? Because what you appear to have discovered makes no sense at all. A concentration of uranium this high? It can't be possible. You work at a uranium enrichment plant in France, you deal with uranium day in and day out, and you know just about everything there is to know. Yet you've never seen anything quite like this. Your task for the day had been to carry out a series of checks on a natural uranium sample. Nothing out of the ordinary for someone who works in a uranium plant. The only reason you were carrying out the checks was a slight isotopic anomaly in some samples from Gabon, and nobody suspected that there wouldn't be a simple explanation. But here you are, looking at a result that contradicts everything you thought you knew. These results suggest that the uranium was involved in a nuclear reaction, but how could a nuclear reaction have happened in a remote mine in Gabon? Maybe it was a contamination. But if not, it could mean a nuclear reaction had happened naturally. That would rewrite history and change everything you thought you knew. See, a nuclear reaction is no small matter. Once upon a time, scientists weren't even sure if such a thing was possible. You remember when the first nuclear reactor was created back in the 1940s? It was man-made, built by a physicist called Enrico Fermi. And you were just a child at the time, so you don't remember the events well, but the whole world was in awe at the groundbreaking discovery. Later, as you went on to study physics, you'd realize what a monumental achievement it was. You learned how Fermi had just been starting his career in physics when scientists discovered nuclear fission for the first time, and he'd begun to ponder the implications. Maybe this mysterious process could be used on purpose by humans to create energy. 
To investigate this theory, he carried out some experiments with uranium, an essential component of nuclear fission. All this would eventually lead to setting up the first nuclear chain reaction, at least so he thought at the time. In 1942, Fermi and his team assembled a reactor built of 45,000 graphite blocks and wood, materials that acted as the reactor's neutron moderator. A powder made of uranium oxide was poured into the blocks to set the right conditions for a reaction. And finally, a control rod made of cadmium was used to control the reaction by absorbing neutrons and acting as a kind of break. The reactor was named Chicago Pile 1. One day later that year, Fermi attempted the experiment. The trick was basically to get the level of criticality needed to guarantee self-sustaining nuclear fission. Nuclear fission happens when an atom splits in two parts and releases energy. Atoms contain protons and neutrons in their central nucleus, but when the nucleus splits during fission, its resulting pieces have less combined mass than the original nucleus. This means mass becomes nuclear energy, which has great potential as a power source. Once the reaction becomes self-sustaining, it can continue with no intervention because the neutrons created through fission give off enough energy to sustain another reaction. For this to be possible, the neutron multiplication factor has to be high enough. Basically, it was a highly complex experiment. Nobody had attempted it before and nobody was sure it would work. So many precise factors had to line up perfectly. No wonder the idea of this happening in nature seemed impossible, but the experiment was successful. It was monumental within your discipline and for all of humankind. Fermi proved nuclear energy could generate power, and his model was used as a baseline for large-scale nuclear reactors built afterwards. Everyone thought it was the first nuclear reactor ever, but how could something that was discovered as recently as 1942 have happened without the intervention of man so long ago? Yet this is what the results are indicating. Your colleagues are incredulous when you tell them. But together you carefully check over the results and consider the possibilities. It was possible the data could be misleading due to contamination. But already your mind was swimming. What if this genuinely had happened naturally? How could it have taken place? How old would the reactor have to be? It was all so crazy. You hadn't even been looking for a nuclear reactor in the first place. But you definitely got more than you'd bargained for. You realized that there was more of the isotope uranium-235 than there should be, more than there had been in any other uranium sample ever. Natural uranium, which is taken from the crust of the Earth or rocks from the Moon, is made up of only around 0.720% of uranium-235. But rock in Oklo only contained 0.717%. It might sound like a pretty minor difference, but it's actually incredibly significant. The concentration of uranium-235 was supposed to be so constant throughout all natural sources in the solar system that it's commonly used to calibrate devices. How come this piece of uranium was breaking an established natural law? And as well as contradicting science, the finding meant that this uranium was the high-grade fissile sort. And since you needed to be sure that none of the uranium handled is used for weapons purposes, you needed to carry out an investigation. It was definitely weird, but whatever. You assumed it had to be some kind of artificial contamination. Maybe this uranium had been contaminated with depleted uranium, which has less U-235 at some point during the production process. This was sounding slightly more likely. You decided to take a look. First, you traced the process of sourcing the uranium back in time. It had been through a long journey to get to where you are now. From the Okla mine in Gabon to a mill nearby to a processing plant in France, and now here, in this enrichment plant. Luckily, samples of the ore were kept along each stage for the very purpose of carrying out investigations like this one. It was easy to check the properties and figure out if there had been any contamination. One by one you checked them over, but the results were strange. It turned out that the samples at every stage had a lower level of uranium-235 than they should. The ore you examined wasn't an anomaly, but why? You were really scratching your head now. Maybe other researchers had already split the isotopes during artificial fission, a nuclear chain reaction similar to the one Fermi carried out. Then again, that seemed unlikely considering the remoteness of the mine in Oklo. After investigating further, it was clear that this wasn't the case. If so, there would be depleted uranium missing, but there wasn't. Another theory was that a bomb had exploded in Africa without anyone noticing. Since bombs cause nuclear reactions, this would have changed the ratio of U-235 and U-238, the other isotope present in uranium. Yet the readings were found to be localized to the ore in the mine, so you had to dismiss that idea too. The mystery grew, unless a natural reaction really had happened. So you looked for fission products, the isotopes of elements created during nuclear fission. Sure enough, there they were. The uranium had somehow become a natural reactor that went critical, burned up a portion of its nuclear fuel, and then shut down. There was only one question left. How? 
You weren't just assuming that any nuclear reaction had to be man-made because you were a stubborn scientist or a fanboy of Fermi. There were good scientific principles to suggest why natural nuclear reactors should be impossible. So to answer the question of how, we need to take a deep dive into the science. There's been plenty of talk of uranium-235, but what even is it? Well, uranium has two principal isotopes, U-235 and U-238. The ratio of these two in uranium ore should be the same everywhere, but that's not to say the ratio has always been the same. Uranium decays over time, and both the isotopes decay differently. Now, U-235 has a shorter half-life, which means its concentration within uranium decreases with time. There was a higher concentration in the past than there is now. For U-238, the opposite is true. Its concentration increases over time. So what? Well, this alone doesn't prove that a natural nuclear reaction took place, but it does give a clue. The ratio of U-238 and U-235 that exists now doesn't make it possible for a nuclear reaction to take place. But if the ratio were different, it could be possible. And since the isotopes decay at different rates, once upon a time the ratio would have been different, and it could have been optimal. Two billion years ago, the ratio of uranium-235 to U-238 was about 3%, which incidentally is perfect for a light water-moderated chain reaction. So the first hint was that the reaction happened a very, very long time ago. And this wasn't the only thing. Other conditions for a nuclear reaction were meant in the Oklo mine. First, there was a high concentration of uranium in the ore body, 10% or more, and the ore was concentrated in seams at least half a meter thick. During a sustained chain reaction, the fissioning of a uranium-235 nucleus emits two and a half neutrons, one of which induces fission in another nucleus, whilst the others are absorbed. The ore seam, therefore, needs to be relatively thick to allow for this absorption. It sounds complicated, but trust me. Secondly, there was water in the mine. This was perhaps the most important part of all. For a nuclear chain reaction to happen and be self-sustaining, it needs a moderator, and water fits the role perfectly. Water slows down neutrons and makes controlled fission possible. Without this, the atoms wouldn't have split. But it can't just be any kind of water. There's both heavy water and so-called ordinary water in the world. Heavy water contains a type of hydrogen called deuterium, whereas ordinary water is made of protium, and it also contains unique properties that allow it to act as a moderator. Nowadays, heavy water is needed for a nuclear reaction to happen, because the ratio of U-235 and U-238 found in uranium now. But remember how the ratio changes over time? Well, two billion years ago, there was more U-235, which means ordinary water could have moderated the reaction. Amazingly, every single condition for a nuclear reactor was met. Theoretically, a fission chain reaction could have been triggered in the uranium deposits all those years ago. But at the same time, it seemed impossible to prove it. You just couldn't go to the mine and check the conditions for the reaction because there was no guarantee that the conditions were the same now as they had been all that time ago. Plus, given that the reaction happened billions of years ago, there would surely be no traces left. The Earth moves over that large a time span, especially uranium in the presence of circulating water like that found in the mine. The only way it could be proven would be through a fossilized nuclear reactor. It seemed like a long shot, but it was worth a go. After investigating the mine, this is exactly what you found. All the conditions had been met, they were still in place now, and there was a fossilized nuclear reactor. Incredible! Even better, you found a footprint of fission products in the ore that was there too. So what did all this mean? What had happened in the Oklo mine? Picking apart the evidence, you were able to paint a fuller picture. It seemed like the fission reaction had continued off and on for hundreds of thousands of years, sustaining itself fully throughout the time. Then eventually it stopped reacting and shut down. This probably happened around 1 billion years ago. To put that into context, humans have only been around for about 200,000 years. Jellyfish, one of the world's oldest species, have been around for maybe 500 million years. Even the Earth itself is only estimated to be 4 or 5 billion years old. Basically, this nuclear reactor is only half as old as the very planet we live on, and it's hard to wrap your head around. But why did this happen in Oklo, and has it ever happened anywhere else? Oklo may have had the right conditions, but it's hard to know why the uranium deposit went critical there. One reason could be the lack of elements in the mine that prevent a reaction taking place, like lead and cadmium. Another possible is its remoteness. While being remote doesn't make a nuclear reaction more likely, it does improve the likelihood of the byproducts being preserved. 
As for whether there have been other natural reactors, there's no way to be certain. Sixteen sites of nuclear fission reactions have been found in Oklo, but none elsewhere in the world. That's not enough to say that there aren't any more, but it's pretty unlikely that conditions would be remote enough to have preserved the evidence anywhere else. Experts suggest that there have been other natural reactors like this that were destroyed by geological processes or eroded away. And what does all this mean, anyway? It might be kinda cool that such an ancient nuclear reactor has been found, but does it have any relevance to anything real? Well, it certainly provides some insights into waste management. While active, Oklo probably depleted around 10 tons of uranium ore. Yet the waste left was so insignificant that visiting researchers didn't even notice. Looking at what happened gives some clues about how to deal with the waste produced by nuclear power plants, which is essential if nuclear ever becomes a conventional source of energy. Boom! Blinding light washes out the landscape around you. Several things all happen within a second. First, your vehicle dies as an electromagnetic pulse spreads at the speed of light, killing all unshielded electronics. In the civilian world, that means practically everything. If you were not blinded by the flash of the explosion, you'd see sparks dancing along the high voltage wires overhead as they're overloaded with electricity. All modern vehicles that rely on fancy computers and electronic gadgets that make them super efficient and comfortable are now just useless hunks of junk on four wheels. Personal computers, cell phones, even pacemakers are all instantly shut down across a 40-mile radius, and they'll never come back online again. The power grid is absolutely ruined and will need to be completely replaced before it's ever operational again, a task that will take years. You're lucky that you were driving in the opposite direction of the detonation point, because if not, you would have been facing toward it. What's just happened about a mile above your city is the birth of a second sun that burns brightly for just a few milliseconds. That's all that's needed to unleash a billion joules of energy, though. And much of that energy is in the visible wavelength and searing the eyes of anyone who happened to be even glancing in its general direction at detonation. Those within a two to three mile radius will be blind forever, assuming they survive what's coming next, while anyone outside of that area might be blind for a matter of hours or minutes depending on the distance. Even those who avoided being permanently blinded will likely suffer at least some vision loss as a result. You're safely out of the immediate impact area, but for those who aren't, ionizing radiation tears through their bodies from the detonation. Their DNA is completely unraveled as the ionizing radiation rips through them. It's like taking millions of microscopic shotgun blasts, only these pellets completely disintegrate the very instructions for life. Most people within a half a mile will die immediately from the radiation exposure, if what comes in the next few seconds doesn't kill them, of course. Outside of that range, the effects of radiation poisoning fall off steeply. You were in your car, which protected you from a lot of the thermal radiation, but not all of it. Your arm was hanging out the window, and even at over two miles from the detonation point, your arm has suffered some pretty nasty second-degree burns. You're lucky. 35% of the energy from a nuclear explosion is released as heat, and anyone caught out in the open can suffer third-degree burns at a distance of up to five miles. If third-degree burns cover 24% of the person's body, or second-degree burns cover 30% of their body, those individuals will go into serious shock with death imminent. All flammable material directly under and surrounding the blast site catch on fire because of the intense heat. Even at two miles out, some of the paint on your car evaporates, and the car door becomes painfully hot to the touch. Tires on vehicles all around you burst as the rubber softens and weakens, while billboards catch on fire. People caught out in the open are consumed in flames as their clothes ignite while they're still wearing them. Some people's hair is literally seared off their heads, leaving behind painful second-degree burns across their scalp. This has just been one second into a nuclear detonation. Your car spins out of control as the tires go flat, but you're lucky to come to an abrupt but mostly safe stop. You have barely enough time to look into the rearview mirror before you see what's coming next. Like an invisible tsunami, the pressure wave is now smashing its way across the landscape, starting from the detonation point and radiating outwards. This has been a nuclear attack using an intercontinental ballistic missile, so the explosion took place a few hundred meters above the city. This way, the pressure wave could expand outwards unimpeded by terrain and buildings. A ground impact is highly unfavorable, as it leads to buildings or terrain features absorbing much of the pressure wave and limiting the damage dramatically. Directly below and up to a mile away from the detonation point, the destruction is complete. Buildings are flattened and tall skyscrapers are annihilated, leaving behind only the very core of each building, jutting up a few hundred feet like a shattered skeletal figure. Plenty of sewers and service tunnels crisscross a modern city, not to mention transportation tunnels in the sub. All of these are collapsed, killing hundreds stuck below or trapping them with no hope of rescue. Outside of a mile, the damage falls off, but is still severe. Multiple-story buildings are seriously damaged, leading to many simply collapsing in on themselves or against their neighbors. 
Buildings with only a few stories are less severely affected, but have every single window blown out and many of their roofs collapse, killing anyone below. At least the tunnels and sewers that crisscross the city here are safe from collapse. Only a few are seriously damaged. Almost no human beings up to two miles out survive if caught out in the open. You're just over two miles out from detonation, and here the damage falls off once again. Windows are blown out and some roofs and walls collapse, but generally buildings remain standing. As the pressure wave catches up to you, your car is physically picked up and tossed, like an angry kid playing with their Hot Wheels cars. The pressure wave blows your car over and threatens to tip it, but you're too far away and your car comes crashing back down onto all four wheels. Debris pelts the landscape around you, and you're mostly safe inside your car. A few people standing out in the street get taken out by chunks of concrete hurtled through the air by a 300 mile an hour wind. The roar of a second sun coming to life above your city has been so incredibly loud that you've temporarily lost all hearing. It'll probably return in time, but for those closer to detonation, they could experience permanent or severe hearing loss. A strange silence falls over the city five seconds after detonation as a massive mushroom cloud slowly drifts up into the sky. Then the screaming starts. Tens of thousands of people seriously injured, tens of thousands less so. You're now on a ticking clock because you've survived the initial explosion through sheer luck, but surviving what comes next is going to take skills, knowledge, and quick thinking. Tick tock, tick tock, you've got 15 minutes before you're dead. What's currently happening and what will kill even more people than the initial explosion is that an ecological disaster is in the brew and about to break out all over you and every survivor in your city. The detonation of a nuclear weapon above your city has sent ionizing radiation all over the landscape, penetrating into the very building materials of the city itself. The thermal flash and pressure wave pulverized all of that irradiated material and turned it into a very fine dust. Then the incredible heat, reaching as much as the surface of the sun for a few milliseconds, creates huge convection currents that suck up gargantuan quantities of air and sends it roaring upward into the sky, hence the mushroom cloud. But all that air is impregnated with billions of tons of highly radioactive dust, and in approximately 15 minutes that dust is going to start falling all around you. You panic because you know what's coming, but you've got a choice to make. You could probably find a working vehicle somewhere and take that to flee the city, trying to outrun the fallout cloud that's about to break over your head. In fact, many people along the suburbs right now are climbing into their cars to do just that. But you're smarter than that. You know that even if you found a working vehicle in the next minute, you could never outrun the cloud of fallout looming overhead. It's being propelled along by winds in the upper atmosphere and will outpace anything but the fastest sports car. Plus, the roads and highways are inevitably going to be choked up with vehicles and other people with the same idea. The particles in the stem of the mushroom cloud will end up falling right back down where they were picked up. Not many people will die from them. But that's pretty much only because anyone under the growing thick black sooty stem of a massive mushroom cloud is already dead from the initial explosion. It's the rest of the billowing cloud that you have to worry about because what goes up definitely comes down. But you're not the only one in danger, as much of the radioactive fallout will reach the uppermost layers of the atmosphere where it will be carried along by strong winds. Massive plumes of radiation will fall for hundreds of miles from the detonation point, poisoning communities entire states away. This is the very reason why Russia might saber-rattle and talk tough about using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, but in reality it would only be shooting itself in the foot as prevailing winds would carry much of the fallout right back into Russia itself. To avoid dying in the next 15 minutes, you have a choice to make. Avoiding radiation poisoning is about three things – time, distance, and shielding. The more time you spend away from a radiation source, the safer you'll be as the radioactive decay, especially in fission byproducts of nuclear explosions, tends to make dangerous particles extremely short-lived. The greater the distance between you and an unshielded radioactive source also means you'll be exposed to less radiation. Meanwhile, shielding takes into account placing barriers between yourself and a radioactive source. If you can't meet the requirements of one, time, distance, or shielding, then you must compensate by adding even more of the other two requirements. To survive a nuclear attack, you're going to have to do all three, though. First, take a look around you. Your first choice, and the absolute worst, is to remain in your vehicle. This will put some shielding and distance between yourself and the fallout. The only good news is that the radioactive debris about to rain down on you is only hazardous if it's extremely close to your body, so if your car can simply physically keep it away from you, odds of survival have greatly increased. You need to put all the windows up and close all the vents, stuffing them with anything that you have available. You can't let there be a single crack. The first radioactive particles to fall will be the size of grains of sand or salt, and these should be easy to keep out. However, over time, the finer radioactive debris will begin to descend and this can be as small as specks of dust. In fact, 
You can detect the presence of radioactive fallout after a nuclear explosion simply by seeing coatings of dust on objects. A car is a terrible survival choice, but it's better than nothing. However, an even better choice is sheltering inside a building with a basement if possible. Basements might not seem like the best choice since so much of the fine debris is going to settle in low places, but the key is to choose a basement with as few entrances as possible, and then to seal those entrances as best you can. However, in many modern cities, especially in sunny SoCal, basements are rare. In that case, you want to move to the centermost area of a home or a building and shelter in place there. Staying at the core of a building will add distance and shielding between yourself and the harmful fallout. But if you're going to survive, you're going to have to take some precautions before the radioactive dust starts falling. Hopefully you've got duct tape available nearby, in which case you need to immediately seal all windows and doors with duct tape. A closed window will be fine to protect you from the initial larger grains of debris that falls down first, but every window is leaky and the finer particles will ride in on those air currents, potentially poisoning you inside your shelter. This is why it's important to seal windows and doors with tape and to make your shelter as far away from any window as possible, ideally past several closed doors. Your first priority is securing your shelter and luckily, you found an intact office building to hide inside along with a few other survivors. Working quickly, you seal off all exterior windows and then taped up the doors leading to the inner core. But now that you're somewhat safe, it's time to get naked. No, you're not repopulating the earth already, you're avoiding a very nasty death by radiation poisoning. If you were outside at the time of detonation, there's a serious risk that you've already contaminated your clothing with radioactive particle debris. That's why any of you who were outside when the bomb went off need to immediately remove all outer garments and put them in a plastic bag of some kind, then seal the bag off. If possible, put that first bag inside a second plastic bag and store it somewhere far away from you and make sure everyone is aware of its location. You're also going to immediately want to start wiping everyone down. This means using the buddy system to get in those hard to reach spots that you can't get by yourself. You're going to be stuck with your new friends for a while, so what better icebreaker than to get naked and give each other a quick wipe down? You need to remove all exterior contamination from your body so that it doesn't rest against your skin and damage your body with ionizing radiation. You can do this with simple soap and water to scrub away any grime, but even just brushing off with a clean cloth is enough. Afterwards, though, anything that you use to clean each other off with is going to have to go into another containment bag. Never reuse or reopen an old containment bag already full of contaminated material. Now that you've avoided the most imminent hazard, exterior contamination, your next greatest threat and one that will persist for a while is interior contamination. This will come from the finer radioactive debris that can get inside wounds or be breathed in and settle into your lungs or along your esophagus. Inside your shelter, your odds of survival are good, but only if you stay in place. You've created distance and shielding, but now you need to add time to the equation. Fallout contamination decays very quickly with it giving off 80% of its energy in the very first day. However, the debris is still energetic enough to be deadly even after one day. For every seven-fold factor of time, dose rates decreases by a factor of 10. Two hours after detonation, the fallout will have lost half its energy, but this can still be extremely deadly. Ideally, you'll want to shelter in place for a full 72 hours before leaving your shelter, at which rate remaining radioactive debris will still be harmful, but only if you remain in contact with it for long amounts of time. Unfortunately, your city is going to be a hell-blasted nuclear landscape after an attack, so you'll be in constant contact with radioactive debris even after three days. That's why the CDC recommends you wait a full seven days before leaving your shelter, as this will give you the best survival rates. By that time, radioactive fallout will have a fraction of its original energy and be much less dangerous. At this point, external contamination is unlikely to be a serious threat anymore, but the biggest threat comes from internal contamination. Too weak to penetrate the skin at this point, radioactive debris that gets lodged into wounds or inside your lungs can still be deadly or pose serious long-term health risks. So when you leave your shelter, you want to take precautions against breathing in fine radioactive particles. Face masks like the type we've been wearing due to the coronavirus outbreak are okay, but not great for this. You'd be better off wetting a t-shirt or other large cloth and wrapping it over your mouth and nose. It's important to keep it wet as the moisture will attract fine particles and trap them and important to cover both your nose and mouth. After any excursion, you'll need to wash whatever protective equipment you've used and all exterior garments. If you can, give your body a good washing down as well, just to remove any fine particles that you might end up breathing in or shoving into a cut or scrape accidentally. Hopefully, you had food and water in your shelter, or at least just water, or you probably aren't making it to this milestone, and your story ends here. But if you've managed to survive seven days, you're now going to have to think about long-term survival. First, you need to consider if it's best to remain where you are or seek help. 
Assuming that this was a small-scale attack, there should still be help from the military or emergency response agencies coming to your city. If it was a full-scale nuclear conflict, though, you're probably completely on your own. If you think help is coming, work on increasing the resiliency of your shelter. Improve the shielding to the outside by creating layers of plastic or cloth like curtains that hang in front of the exterior doors. This will help keep radioactive dust down as people go in and out. If you can, simply make suits out of garbage bags to wear over your outer clothing. That way, it can be removed and thrown away in specified disposal locations after each trip. If you've got water to spare, create two cleaning areas for boots. You can do this by filling two buckets with water and dipping your boots into each one in succession. After a few rinses, dispose of the water somewhere so there's no chance of it contaminating you or your shelter. You're going to want to pay special attention to boots and feet, as they'll be the most likely to get saturated with fine radioactive debris since most of it will settle on the ground. You'll also want to make sure your shelter is visible to search and rescue parties who are looking for survivors. Create large geometric shapes made of bright materials to immediately grab the attention of a helicopter or passing rescue vehicle or patrol. SOS is a global sign of distress, but in a city you should be able to find many creative ways of making it obvious that your shelter is occupied with survivors. Make sure to regularly clean your emergency displays to make it obvious people are still alive, otherwise rescue workers might simply assume that the shelter has been abandoned. Whether you move out or shelter in place, you'll probably need to find food and water eventually. It should be obvious, but avoid anything that isn't completely sealed in non-permeable material like plastic. Canned goods are excellent options as they're airtight, but even pastas or breads in plastic wrapping is okay to eat as long as the wrapping is completely sealed. Just don't open any food items outside of your shelter, and it's best to wrap them in cloth or plastic as you transport them through the outside world and back into your shelter, though as usual you'll need to decontaminate whatever you use to protect them. You'll also want to get rid of the wrapping material or tin cans after they're done if they've been in an unsecured area where they could have been exposed to outside dust. Water will be trickier, because there will almost certainly be no electricity in your city, which means no water pumps to supply water. If you're lucky enough to be in a safe interior location when an attack takes place, immediately plug up sinks and bathtubs and fill them with water, if it's still flowing. Underground water pipes will be safe from the radioactive fallout for a long time, but not forever as eventually the body of water that feeds them will be contaminated. That's why even if you have running water after an attack, you don't want to rely on it. Better yet, stock up on water bottles which should be easy to find in shopping centers and corner stores after an attack. Most water bottles are made of thick plastic which will keep the content safe even after fallout has descended. However, as usual, you want to decontaminate every bottle of water you bring into your shelter from the outside before you start messing with it. If you can't find water, your best option might be just to start moving and get out of the city or head toward emergency services. Major airports are a good place to head toward as it's likely this is where the first rescue efforts will take place. However, if you can't reach one, or if government help isn't coming, survival will still depend on getting out of the city. It'll help if you can figure out which way the prevailing winds are blowing and head perpendicular to them. You don't want to head into the wind because you could just be getting facefuls of contaminated dust. Instead, much like a rip current, head perpendicular and get out of the stream of air that's carrying radioactive waste. Once you're out of the city, your best bet is to head toward high ground. You're safer on the leeward side of a mountain where the wind hasn't blown radioactive dust and debris onto the soil. Radioactive fallout will settle in low areas, and rains and streams will wash it down the mountains and into the valleys and plains below. It would be wise to learn what major drinking water sources are around your city and then head to those that are on high ground. If you can shelter in a safe area for a few months, radioactivity levels and remaining debris should be manageable. At this point, if you're forced to continue living in the area of a nuclear attack, a long healthy life is out of the question, but you can probably enjoy a moderately long life with few serious health problems. Some radioactive elements will remain deadly for years. Strontium-90, for instance, is still dangerous after 10 years, as is cesium-137. If you can't get away from the site of a nuclear attack or if your entire nation has come under attack, there's probably little you can do to avoid these dangers, as these elements will become part of the environment itself. But there's a reason why both Hiroshima and Nagasaki are habitable today, and that's because a nuclear attack from another nation will almost certainly be of the airburst variety. A ground burst weapon is one designed to explode when it hits the ground. This greatly limits its destructive potential, but also causes massive plumes of irradiated material. However, an airburst weapon explodes above its target so the destructive shockwave and thermal radiation can hit as wide an area as possible. This also comes with the benefit of shooting much of the weapon's radioactive output into the atmosphere or into space. Within days of both the Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosions, people were inhabiting the ruins and living lives with few if any health effects. So cheer up, because the end isn't here after all. 
Now it's time to grab your trusty Pip-Boy and head off into the greatest Fallout LARP event the world has ever put on. One week before a U.S. nuclear launch. The United States has been closely monitoring Russian movements in Ukraine. Recently, some unsettling images have been brought to light. Satellite imagery reveals nuclear weapons being moved to airfields just across the border in Russia. Mobile launchers also appear to be on the move. The U.S. military intelligence officers scour the data to make sure what they're seeing is accurate. Several MAZ-7917 transporter erector launchers carry RT-2PM Topol ballistic missiles dangerously close to European borders. It looks as if several of the nuclear missiles are positioned to attack the front lines of the Ukrainian conflict. Others have been moved to the far reaches of Russia's eastern territories. This is unsettling for the United States and its NATO allies, as Vladimir Putin is not known for his level-headedness. As his forces suffer defeat after defeat in Ukraine, he might be willing to take drastic measures. The President of the United States is informed of the deployment of nuclear missiles across Russia. He ponders what might be going through Putin's head, but quickly realizes it's a rabbit hole he doesn't wish to go down. Instead, the President of the United States orders several Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines to deploy closer to Russian shores. If a nuclear response by the United States is needed, these submarines will play a vital role in quickly striking key targets before Russia has time to launch a full-scale nuclear attack. The nation's defense network is put on high alert, as intelligence officers try to gather as much intel as possible to provide the President the opportunity to make the most informed decision. B-2A Spirit stealth bombers take off from Whiteman Air Force Base to fly alert patrols near the Russian mainland. They're loaded with GBU-57AB Massive Ordnance Penetrator bombs in case things go sideways and the U.S. needs to take out Russian high-priority targets hidden deep within protective bunkers. A few B-2s are equipped with B-83 nuclear bombs, however, these aircraft will remain grounded until further notice. These nukes have a maximum yield of 1.2 megatons, making them some of the most powerful nukes in the U.S. arsenal. 24 hours before a U.S. nuclear launch Over the past several days, things have escalated. Ukrainian troops have pushed Russian forces all the way back to Crimea. The Chinese Navy has created a blockade around Taiwan, and Kim Jong-un has been spouting nonsense and threats that if the U.S. tries to interfere with their allies' plans, North Korea is mobilizing forces across the DMZ. In a matter of days, global security has gone from relatively stable, except in Ukraine, to terrifyingly uncertain in multiple parts of the world. The President of the United States doesn't sleep anymore. He keeps a close eye on events unfolding across the Atlantic and in the Pacific. Right now, the best thing that the U.S. and its NATO allies can do is prepare. Everyone was already on high alert, but now the President never lets the nuclear football out of his sight. 47 minutes before a U.S. nuclear launch A high-ranking general bursts into the Oval Office. The President sits at his desk, staring at the latest images coming in from around the world. Russia, China, and North Korea all seem to be posturing toward taking drastic actions. The President can see by the look on this general's face that this is not going to be good news. Then an emergency alert reaches the President directly from the Pentagon. Russia has launched a nuclear missile. A network of satellites tracks the thermal signature of the Russian nuke. It's heading west toward Europe. The President knows the target is not the United States, as if Russia were to attack the US, their ballistic missiles would fly over the Arctic. However, until more data comes in, the exact location of where the nuke is headed is unknown. The President picks up the red phone on his desk and gets the Secretary of Defense on the other line. It's agreed that everyone should meet in the Situation Room to plan out what the next steps will be. 35 minutes before a US nuclear launch The Russian missile separates in the atmosphere, and now four warheads all fall toward the city of Kiev. Three of the warheads are decoys, but one contains a nuke that could decimate the entire capital of Ukraine. Every NASAMS and anti-air system in Ukraine fires simultaneously. They try desperately to destroy the warheads before the nuke detonates. Most of these systems were designed to take out aircraft, but desperate times call for desperate measures. The world holds its breath, and the seconds tick by. One of the anti-air missiles gets a lucky hit. There's an explosion high up in the atmosphere. It's not clear how many of the warheads were destroyed or if the real nuclear device was the one that was hit. The people of Kyiv take shelter, preparing for the worst. The President of the United States sits in the Situation Room with his generals, praying that this is all just a nightmare he'll wake from. 34 minutes before a U.S. nuclear launch, the Russian nuclear warhead detonates over the city of Kyiv. In an instant, millions of lives are lost. The capital of Ukraine is reduced to a smoldering crater surrounded by irradiated ruins. 33 minutes before a U.S. nuclear launch. Sir, what are your orders? The Secretary of Defense asks the President. His eyes are still fixed on the screen, showing a mushroom cloud rising over what was once Kyiv. Sir, the Secretary of Defense screams. The President closes his eyes and shakes his head. 
We cannot let him get away with this, the president whispers. Get me the leaders of NATO on the phone. We need everyone on the same page before what happens next. 15 minutes before a US nuclear launch, the president of the United States ends the call between the leaders of NATO. He looks around the situation room at his military advisors. The conversation was brief. Everyone agreed that Russia's actions cannot stand without consequences. There needs to be some form of retaliation by NATO. It's clear that Putin has lost his mind. After the nuclear attack, China almost immediately pulled its ships and other forces back to the mainland in an attempt to de-escalate the conflict in East Asia. Even they can't believe that Vladimir Putin would fire a nuclear missile at Ukraine. China has a strict policy of only using nuclear weapons to defend its own territory. They condemn Russia for escalating the war in Ukraine into a much more dangerous global conflict. The Situation Room is silent. The European countries and NATO have already begun mobilizing their forces. The plan is to hit Putin hard and fast. But the problem is, the mad Russian dictator still has more nuclear weapons, many more. The President of the US has declared that Vladimir Putin must be immediately punished and that NATO needs to send a clear message. The US has taken it upon itself to launch a retaliatory nuclear strike against several key military installations across Russia. These nukes will not target major cities or population areas, but they will cripple Russia's nuclear stores and military infrastructure. I've made my decision, the President says. Bring me the coats. 13 minutes before a US nuclear launch. Everyone turns to look at the man holding the black briefcase in the corner of the Situation Room. For a moment, he doesn't move. He knows the ramifications of delivering the briefcase to the President now that he's made up his mind. But it is his sworn duty. The man takes a step forward and carries the nuclear football to the table. He places it in front of the President of the United States and returns to his post. The President unlatches the clasps of the briefcase. They swing open with a satisfying click. The President then opens the case and pulls out the contents, laying them out on the table in front of him. First, the President opens the Black Book, which contains the retaliatory options available to him. There are all types of scenarios. The President runs his index finger over the table of contents until he lands on the one he's looking for. He flips through the pages and finds the correct one. The room is as quiet as a graveyard. It's as if the air has been sucked out of the chamber. No one moves. The President reads what's written on the page to himself and nods his head. He closes the black book and opens another booklet that contains a list of classified sites and their locations around the globe. It's here that he finds the targets that will be hit when he gives the final order to launch nukes at Russia. The president closes the book and opens a manila folder that contains several pages of authentication codes. He picks up the phone and calls the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. They've been expecting his call. The voice on the other line speaks an authentication code into the receiver to verify that the person on the other line is, in fact, the President of the United States. The President pauses for a moment as he reads the words on the laminated card known as the Biscuit. These words are known only to the President and confirm his identity. The member of the National Military Command Center listens to the response. It is correct. Next, the President relays the specific code that signifies which type of strike he wants. Now that the President has chosen to launch, there's nothing anyone can do to stop the process. The President of the United States is the only one who can authorize a nuclear launch and is the only one who can cancel it once the process has begun. This makes many people in the Situation Room and around the country nervous, especially if they don't agree with his decision. But there's nothing anyone can do about it now. Five minutes before a US nuclear launch. The codes have been authenticated. The identity of the President has been confirmed. The encrypted instructions on what missiles should be prepared for launch and their targets are sent out to all parties involved. These sealed authentication system codes are received by military personnel around the world. When they come in, safes are opened at each site to retrieve the verification codes to ensure the SAS codes are real. Underground launch control centers that control the Minuteman missile silos in the heart of the country prepare for launch. Air Force generals order B-2 pilots to report to their planes. Deep under the waters of the Pacific Ocean, encrypted communications are sent to the Ohio-class submarines, who ready their nuclear missiles for launch. In each instance, the NMCC orders are authenticated one more time by those who receive them to ensure that the most serious decision that's ever been made is real. The NMCC sends out actual missile launch codes. There is one more failsafe to ensure that every possible opportunity to abort the firing sequence has been given. One minute before a US nuclear launch. The crews at the underground missile silos open a box containing two keys. The commander at the facility holds onto one and gives the other to his second in command. Submarine captains hand off a key to their first mate, who walks over to one of the terminals aboard the submarine and prepares for what comes next. The captain pulls his own key out from the chain around his neck. The B-2s that are en route to their targets have been given the authorization to go weapons free. The two pilots in each cockpit are tasked with ensuring their payload hits the correct target. 10 seconds before a US nuclear launch. 
There's collective anticipation across every branch of the military at this point. All high-ranking officers know what's about to happen. The US is going to war and it's launching nukes to kick off what will likely be a catastrophic series of events. There's still hope that by destroying most of Russia's nuclear capabilities, an all-out nuclear exchange can be avoided, but this can't be confirmed with 100% accuracy. The seconds tick down. 5 seconds before a US nuclear launch. Each launch requires that both keys are turned within milliseconds of each other. This ensures that no single person is responsible for launching the nukes and adds another layer of protection against unintentionally starting a nuclear war. One second before a US nuclear launch. The keys turn in their slots. The launch of the United States' nuclear arsenal is initiated. The nuclear triad is the backbone of America's national security. The triad consists of land, air, and sea nuclear launch capabilities, and the President's decision requires that all three branches fire their missiles at Russia. One second after US nuclear missiles are launched. The engines on 100 Minuteman III missiles roar to life in their underground silos. These ballistic missiles are located in Colorado, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Wyoming. The ground shakes as the silo doors open, and the Minuteman missiles roar into the sky. These ICBMs will fly over the Arctic to hit their targets on the other side of the world. The soldiers working in the underground launch control centers ask for forgiveness as they listen to the nukes take flight. The commanders at each facility are still on the phone with the President of the United States and the National Military Command Center. They update them on the progress as the missiles rise higher and higher into the atmosphere. Airborne missile combat crews monitor the ICBMs once they enter the upper atmosphere to ensure they're still on target. The Minuteman III rockets have a range of over 6,000 miles. They accelerate toward their top speed of 15,000 miles per hour, which is around Mach 23. Each missile weighs just under 80,000 pounds, which is a lot of weight to launch 700 miles above the Earth's surface. The rockets use three solid propellant motors to get the job done. Seven Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines rise close to the surface just off the Kamchatka Peninsula. This is only half of the Ohio-class subs that the US has at its disposal, but for the current mission, it's all that's needed. The way the submarines were designed makes them almost impossible for the enemy to locate until they surface, and at that point it's too late. Each submarine can carry 20 ballistic missiles with independently targeted warheads. This means that each one of the warheads can be assigned a different target. This will make it incredibly hard for Russia to intercept them all or launch effective countermeasures. It's almost inevitable that at least some of the missiles will hit their targets. The Trident II D-5 missiles erupt out of their submarine silos and accelerate into the air. As soon as the missiles have been launched, the silo doors are closed, and the submarine descends back into the depths of the ocean where it'll hide from any enemy ships trying to locate it. The submarines stealthily make their way back to their respective naval bases to be resupplied for their next mission. There's no rush at this point, as the Ohio-class subs typically spend 77 days at sea before returning for routine maintenance. However, if they needed to, the subs could stay underwater for much longer, as they're nuclear-powered and don't need to surface to replenish air. Instead, they use electrolysis to break apart H2O molecules and generate oxygen for the crew. The B-2 bombers are still traveling toward their objectives. Their timing has been precisely planned out, so they drop their bombs as soon as the first nuclear missiles hit their targets. The key to the President's plan is that the nukes strike Russia almost simultaneously, five minutes after US nuclear missiles are launched. NATO forces have launched a series of aerial and ground attacks into Russian territory. Their main objective is to serve as a decoy for what's to come. Bombers and fighter jets hit key Russian radar stations that survey the northern edges of Russian territory and the skies over the Arctic. This is done to prevent early detection of the incoming ballistic missiles arcing over the North Pole of the planet. Ground forces speed toward Moscow in an attempt to force Putin's attention on the invasion instead of the strategic nuclear strikes that the US just launched. It's a race against time for NATO forces. They need to cause as much damage and mayhem as possible to distract the mad dictator of Russia from launching his own nukes. Long-range missiles target key communication hubs between Moscow and the rest of the country. The more disruptive NATO forces can be, the better the chances the US nukes have at hitting their targets without being intercepted. 15 minutes after US nuclear missiles are launched, the Trident II D-5 missiles descend toward their targets. Simultaneously, the B-2s drop their nuclear bombs. These stealth aircraft are supplemented by a handful of B-21 Raiders with upgraded tech and longer ranges. The Russians have no idea that these aircraft have entered their airspace. They claimed that their newest forms of radar could detect even stealth bombers, but this, like so much of Russia's military posturing, is just a fabrication. The pilots sight their targets using a combination of infrared sensors, satellite telemetry, and high-tech radar. 
They've already been given the all clear to drop their nukes since they must maintain radio silence while in Russian airspace to keep from being detected. Each B-2 drops 16 2,400-pound B-83 nuclear bombs. They use sophisticated guidance systems to ensure that the nukes hit their targets. In an instant, dozens of nuclear missiles and bombs detonate above key Russian military installations. The distraction by NATO forces seems to have worked. The already weakened Russian military is so understaffed due to the war in Ukraine that they just didn't have the personnel to effectively monitor the NATO attacks and the incoming US nuclear warheads. However, it's now clear what the strategy is. Putin screams at his generals to launch any Russian nukes that remain. At that very moment, a B-61 thermonuclear gravity bomb penetrates the ground near where Vladimir Putin is hunkered down in a bunker. The nuke detonates and instantly wipes out the Russian president and his closest generals. This will cause a breakdown in the chain of command and should deter Russia from launching its own nukes. Luckily, the classified information the President of the United States had included detailed instructions on where the first nuclear warheads needed to strike to deactivate the Russian dead hand contingency. The automated system is supposed to kick in if the Russian leadership is ever killed in a nuclear attack. Dead Hand uses information and sensors to determine if an all-out retaliatory strike should be launched if Russian leadership has been compromised. However, the system was from the Soviet era, and like many of the military systems that carried over from the time period, it was not properly maintained. A few well-placed nuclear strikes have completely disabled the Dead Hand system and have kept Russian protocols from instantly launching every remaining nuke they had at US and NATO targets. 30 minutes after US nuclear missiles are launched, the Minuteman 3 ICBMs are about to strike their targets. The warheads are descending toward the Earth at top speed. The remaining leaders of the Russian military use the A-135 system, which once consisted of 68 nuclear-armed interceptors and phased-array radar stations to track and destroy incoming missiles. But the first strike by the US has already decimated countless bases and assets, rendering their defensive network almost completely inoperable. The Russian Unified Air Defense System is still relaying information. The problem is, the military personnel required to effectively launch nuclear countermeasures have been decimated by the initial attack and by the war in Ukraine. However, two of the six Voronezh early warning radar installations still remain and are connected to the S-400 and S-500 anti-missile systems. The S-400 is designed to intercept aircraft and ballistic missiles with a range of up to 250 miles. The upgraded version of these missiles has an active radar to help them track incoming targets. The Russian military launches several S-400 at the incoming Minuteman 3s. Several hit their targets and detonate. Russia also has next-generation S-500s, but with a shortage of semiconductors and materials due to sanctions from the war in Ukraine, the upgrading of their missile defense systems has yet to be completed. The Minuteman 3 nukes hit their marks. Almost all of the major Russian targets that the President of the US ordered to be destroyed are now either vaporized or consumed by fire. The Russian landscape is covered in radiation. Its military is decimated. Key Russian government and military leaders are no more. The mission was a success, but at what cost? A US nuclear launch is something that the world hopes will never happen again. The worst case scenario finally happened. The bombs are in the air, and in a matter of minutes, the United States will be hit by a nuclear attack. Millions are in danger along with the entire future of the United States government. What now? This isn't the first time the threat of nuclear annihilation was high on the government's mind. Ever since the US beat the Nazis to the bomb and was followed by the Soviets only years later, the government's been preparing for the worst case scenario of a nuclear strike on the homeland. Initially, the threat was the Soviet Union, the United States' arch nemesis. But now the threat of nuclear attack comes from China, Russia, North Korea, Pakistan, rising powers like Iran, and even international terror groups. No one knows whether any of these besides the first two even have the capability to hit the United States. But the government is not going to test their luck. After the September 11th terror attacks, the government quickly moved to plan for all eventualities and have a plan of action in case of worst-case scenarios. There are multiple scenarios created by the Department of Homeland Security, and a nuclear attack is national response scenario number one. Ominously, the scenarios are ranked by how likely they are to occur, which means the government thinks that a nuclear attack on the homeland is the most likely catastrophic scenario to occur, and dealing with it will not be simple. The government's first step is to try to keep a lid on the nuclear threat, and that's a lot more complicated than it used to be. In the Cold War, keeping the nukes from being launched usually meant talking to one man, the premier of the Soviet Union. 
While other countries had nuclear weapons, they were usually firmly aligned with one of two sides. Now, with India and Pakistan both having nukes and being in a low-boil state of war with each other, plus the notoriously unstable Kim regime testing missiles all the time, there are far more variables, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union and instability in other regimes, means it's possible for nuclear weapons and dirty bombs to wind up on the black market. Which means that nuclear weapons could hit the homeland in more ways than one. The biggest threat is long-range nuclear missiles, which carry the biggest payload. It's believed that only Russia and China have the ability to hit the US this way, with North Korea working hard to join the club. Other countries' nuclear missiles are mostly designed to deal with threats in their backyard. While this is the most predictable threat, it's also the most dangerous. These are the missiles that will carry the biggest payload and could annihilate a whole metro area in a single hit. The United States, Russia, and China each have enough of these to annihilate life on Earth several times over which is why an early warning system is key. The United States, Canada, and Denmark developed a radar system during the Cold War to warn of incoming Soviet missiles. Because the shortest route for a Soviet missile was through the North Pole, they built the infrastructures throughout the Arctic. Those systems were the building blocks for ballistic missile warning systems around the world, and they're still in play today, although they're not foolproof. During the Cold War, there were several false alarms of incoming missiles, and nuclear war was only averted by cool-headed commanders, who often defied protocol to hold off on launching a full-scale response. And even in the modern day, there were false alarms. In 2018, residents of Hawaii received an emergency text about an incoming ballistic missile, sending most of the island into a panic. Those were false alarms, but the real one could come at any minute. In the event of an actual nuclear attack, the government has many plans to keep things running. The first priority is to ensure the safety of the president and the key to the United States' defense, the nuclear football. Despite what the media wants you to think, there is no briefcase with a big button to launch the nukes, which is probably a good thing given how some presidents might have hit it because someone insulted them on Twitter. Instead, to launch any nuclear weapons, the president uses a briefcase to communicate with the Pentagon from anywhere and give his instructions. And his orders are absolute. The president's orders are authenticated through the Pentagon, but their only purpose is to confirm that the president is the one giving the orders. Once the president gives the command to launch nuclear weapons in retaliation of an attack or as a first strike, the Pentagon has no authority to deny the order. They confirm the president's identity including the current nuclear codes and launch. Some have said this gives the president too much power, with Major Harold Herring pointing out some of the flaws in the program during the Cold War. He was promptly removed from the missile training program for asking too many questions. But before the missiles launch, the president has to be kept alive. Once it's clear the missiles are in the air, the president will immediately be spirited away to an emergency bunker, whatever the closest one is to his location. This is likely to be a short and easy trip, because the government has dozens of these bunkers around the country, each equipped to be a local command center for the president and a place where the survivors can be kept alive long term. These bunkers are where the worst case scenario plays out. If life on the surface becomes impossible due to nuclear fallout, the US government can survive underground, and some of these facilities are massive. While most of these and their locations are kept secret, the largest are well known, but that doesn't mean you can get in to take a tour. Raven Rock, located in southern Pennsylvania, is a massive US military installation that serves as a command center for the armed forces. Each of the four branches have a base here along with Mount Weather in Virginia and Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado. All three are built into mountains and are massive looking more like a city than an office building. The only people who have access to these centers are essential military personnel who have high enough clearance to have access to the core of the government's nuclear preparedness plan. But what if the president can't be saved? No one knows where the first missile will hit, and it's possible that the president, the vice president, and the leaders of Congress, the Speaker of the House, and the President pro tempore will be at ground zero when a nuclear attack hits Washington. This could throw the US government into chaos with no clear leader, which is why the order of succession is locked into the Constitution. If the first four leaders are wiped out, the order of succession starts working its way down the cabinet, starting with the Secretary of State and moving down by when the cabinet positions were created. That makes the Secretary of Homeland Security last in line since they hold the most recent seat, and the government takes great care to ensure it's never completely wiped out. The entire line of succession is never in the same place at the same time. This most often comes into play with the State of the Union address. One cabinet official is always chosen to stay behind and hold down the fort in a safe location in case an attack wipes out Congress, the designated survivor. This is an orderly way of handling things, but in the event of a nuclear attack, it's most likely to come down to whoever happens to be the luckiest. So the military's first task, in the event of an unexpected attack, might be to track down the survivor who's first in line and let them know they're now president. Well, good, the president is secure, whoever it is. What about the rest of us? 
Back when the nuclear weapons were first developed, the plans to survive an attack were rudimentary at best. People built bomb shelters, but it's not clear if any of them actually could have withstood a nuclear blast. As for the government, they knew that people would likely only have minutes of warning before Soviet weapons hit, and very few places to hide. So their advice was to get under your desk. American school children during the 1950s became very acquainted with the duck and cover drill, which joined the iconic fire drill in regular routines. Was hiding under your desk going to make a difference in a nuclear attack? Of course not, but it made people feel like they had more control over their fate. So it might have done its job at the time, and hey, it was promoted by a cartoon turtle. But in the event of an actual nuclear strike, the government did have plans to try to preserve what it could. Communication will be key in the immediate aftermath of a nuclear attack. So who gets put in charge? Not the Department of Defense, surprisingly, the Environmental Protection Agency. This is because the biggest threat after the initial blasts will be the radiation in the air. Anyone who is caught in the immediate blast radius is gone, and those who did manage to get far enough from the blast will not last long without the government's help. But in the aftermath, knowing what to do might make the difference between survival and dying of radiation sickness. So the EPA has released a series of scripts designed to guide people through the aftermath of an attack. Some of them are common sense, and some might keep people from making fatal mistakes. Scripts tell people how to get their hands on food or water, and warn them to get as far away from the blast site as they can. They also warn people to avoid public spaces, as the risk of making your way to the hospital or fire station is too high to take unless you have a pressing medical emergency. Surprisingly, they say that if you're in your car when the bombs hit, that's the safest place to be. It might be tempting to abandon the car and seek a safer place, but the car actually shields you quite a bit from outside the radiation, so hunkering down in your car might be your best bet. But advice can only go so far. The government's prepared for all eventualities, and even though the risk of nuclear war has declined since the Cold War, they're staying stocked with medication that could alleviate sickness in the aftermath of a nuclear attack. This is part of the Strategic National Stockpile, a cache of emergency medication stored for a disaster. This stockpile is spread out among a network of warehouses around the United States and could be used to respond to a sudden disease outbreak or a natural disaster. But the most important part of the cache is its stock of medicine designed to help with radiation sickness. Of course, this doesn't help the people caught at ground zero or those who receive a fatal dose, but it could help to reduce casualties in the aftermath. And who would be handling the distribution? That would be the one organization everyone hopes is wasting taxpayer money, because they'll have only something to do in the aftermath of a massive disaster. The Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise, or the tongue-twisting acronym PHEMCE. It's the government's last resort agency in the event of a nuclear disaster. This is especially important because it's possible some agencies might be wiped out by the attack and others might be unable to communicate due to infrastructure being destroyed. So this division will coordinate between around a dozen government agencies, including the CDC and Defense Department. The goal will be to get supplies and medication out to the people, communicate safety measures, figure out where the attack came from and decide on a response. But there's only so much the government can do. The government does have bunkers around the country, with Raven Rock being the biggest and most secure. No one's sure exactly how many there are or what their capacity is, but it's become clear that in the event of a large-scale nuclear disaster, it'll be impossible to save everyone. During the 1950s, the bombs were smaller and slower, and we were more likely to have advanced warning. No country had nearly as many nukes as they do today, and the population of the United States was much smaller. Then, the bombs kept growing and growing, and so did the population. Weapons were developed that could wipe out whole cities in a matter of seconds. So the plan changed. During the Reagan administration, two influential men were brought in to meet with the president. Their names? Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. While they'd become famous or infamous a few decades later, they were only trusted advisors now, and Reagan wanted them to develop a Cold War strategy to ensure the survival of U.S. leadership during a nuclear war. Tensions with the Soviet Union were heating up again, and a nuclear war could break out at any time, so every year they would head off to a secret mission and plan an escape route for the line of succession. While the plan is highly classified, it's believed it involved the key officials being split up and flown to separate bunkers, with each team including a cabinet member and officials representing the Department of Defense, State Department, and the CIA. So no matter who survived, the infrastructure would be there to take command. But what would life be like for those who survived? The plan was for an extended stay underground in the bunkers, which would be well stocked with the basics of survival, but not much else. Life down there would be spartan, with food likely being strictly rationed for long-term survival and designed to be shelf-stable because its job was to sit there until it was needed. During the 50s, the government initially urged people to keep a week's supply of canned goods on hand in case of a nuclear event, but more research showed this wouldn't provide much beyond a stay of execution. Much more would be needed if a family wanted to survive a nuclear attack. 
so the government began preparing emergency rations. The solution? The all-purpose survival cracker, a hard and mostly tasteless cracker made out of bulgur wheat. It came in individual packets along with a tiny hard candy that was called a carbohydrate supplement. They were designed to be shelf-stable, but they didn't last forever. When there was an attempt to use the crackers in the 70s in disaster zones, it was clear they had long since expired. They were designed for a time when nuclear war felt very real, almost expected. But when the apocalypse didn't happen, they fell out of use and production stopped. Today, they're not really needed. The selection of cheap, accessible canned foods that can last years or more is so large that people can stock their apocalypse pantry with ease. But the odds are people in charge have much better provisions. No one knows exactly what it's like in buildings like Raven Rock, but the sheer size of the facilities means they likely have room to supply a staff of hundreds or even thousands for years at a time. So the president won't be going hungry, and he might even be able to bring his personal chef along although he, like everyone else, would be limited to shelf-stable, long-lasting foods. But for the rest of us, we're back to the old advice of keeping a supply of canned goods to last us until the outside was safe again. But the government isn't really advising people to plan for a nuclear disaster anymore, even if the odds of one are slightly higher than they were post-Cold War. And even if the government isn't planning for a war, that doesn't mean they're not ready for one. What would happen if the United States was actually hit by a nuclear attack, killing millions and wiping out much of the US government? It would be clear that a state of war existed, but what if the government didn't know exactly where the bombs came from at first? The Mobile Command Center's first task would be to track the bombs to make sure that we were hitting the right target country in response. This is only applicable in the event of a missile attack. The most likely method, if an unconventional nuclear attack was launched, such as a suitcase nuke or a dirty bomb, the government's initial efforts would be on relief and investigation. But when a culprit was uncovered, whether it was a terrorist group or a rogue state, there would be hell to pay. But what if it was a superpower? The most likely threat to the US in the Cold War was the Soviets deciding to strike first, because it decided it was time to vanquish its greatest enemy and put the entire world under the Soviet boot. Was this a realistic outcome? No one's sure, and most of the times nuclear war nearly broke out was because of brinksmanship and mistaken intelligence. But if the Soviet Union did hit the US, the Defense Department had a plan, and it was a plan for maximum damage. It was called the Single Integrated Operational Plan. It was a doomsday agenda to unleash over 1,700 nuclear devices across more than 700 targets, wiping out all major Soviet and Chinese cities as well as targets in other communist nations like North Korea. It's not clear how this plan evolved over the years, but one thing that was shocking about it was that it made no distinction whether a communist country had attacked the US or not. But would this plan work today? In a word, no. When the plan was designed, the bombs being used were 80 kilotons, four times the strength of the bomb that hit Nagasaki. Today, most nuclear missiles are much, much more powerful than that, and an attack of that strength would likely not just annihilate the enemy, but cause a level of nuclear fallout that would make life on the surface completely inhospitable long term. The clouds would carry the poison all around the world, even far from the sites that were initially hit. In a best case scenario, people would be forced to live underground for years. In worst scenarios, it could mean the end of all life on Earth. That means any response today would likely be much more targeted. But it's highly likely it would still involve a nuclear hit on the power structures of the enemy behind the attack. Other elements of the response plan would have thankfully been abandoned as well. One of the most infamous parts of World War II was the arrest and internment of thousands of Japanese Americans solely based on their ethnicity by the United States, with most being held for years until the war ended. And so naturally, during the Cold War, some people looked at this blatant civil rights violation and went, how can I make this work for me? J. Edgar Hoover, the notoriously paranoid FBI chief, was known for keeping an enemies list, and he advocated for the president using it as a base for detaining and arresting anyone deemed to be a potential subversive. This would likely have involved any foreign aliens in the United States, as well as potentially anyone of the nationality of the attackers. These plans were never put into effect, but no one is sure what lists the government is still making. But the biggest challenge for the government in the aftermath of a nuclear attack may just be the people. The United States has a grand tradition of reacting with calm and solidarity in the event of a disaster. We have no doubt that, oh, who are we kidding? It's only been a few years since 2020, and we all remember fighting over that last roll of toilet paper in the aisles of Target. When a disaster happens, it often becomes much worse because people overreact and become paranoid and hostile. In the aftermath of a nuclear attack, it's likely people would panic, and that can make a bad situation worse. If people are running around willy-nilly, it could lead to a higher death rate due to radiation poisoning. It could also lead to a surge in crime at a time when the authorities are occupied with a much bigger problem. So the government decided to see how much it could predict before it happened. 
The Department of Defense regularly runs simulations on their computer systems for specific types of disasters, such as a nuclear attack going off right over the White House. The system was created by a researcher at Virginia Tech, Chris Barrett, who specializes in massive simulations that involve variables for thousands of people. Using one of the most advanced computers in the world, it maps out which outcomes would cause the best results, and which would cause the worst. These simulations were picked up by the government, and they're now a regular feature of the government planning for events they hope never comes to pass. So, what are the best and worst case scenarios? The best case scenarios usually involve people acting responsibly, taking heed of advice, and concentrating on their own safety. The worst case scenarios become a reality when people decide to head for ground zero, or to try to help people caught in the disaster zone. Not only will there be few if any survivors after a nuclear blast, but those would-be heroes often sentence themselves to death due to the fallout. So what are the government's plans now? Many of the plans from the Cold War are still in effect to some degree, just updated to modern technology that makes it easier to communicate and take action wherever the leadership may be. With our communications infrastructure being stronger than ever before, odds are good that the government would be able to stay in contact with its citizens and keep them as calm as possible. But as for what would come next, that's highly classified, and hopefully will stay so forever. In Eastern Europe, the war over Ukraine has heated up to unprecedented levels. Despite being cautioned against it, the Russian President Vladimir Putin has authorized the use of chemical weapons against the stubborn Ukrainian resistance. Thousands have died since the attacks began. The President of the United States had warned Putin there would be an appropriate response if he dared to use weapons of mass destruction. Stockpiles of American VX gas had been moved to Europe in anticipation of just such an event, and now cruise missiles laden with a deadly gas rain down amongst Russian troops. VX is banned by the UN's Chemical Weapons Convention of 1993, but the US has retained its Cold War-era stockpiles as a deterrent. Now, thousands of Russian soldiers die as the deadly nerve agent paralyzes their bodies, and they slowly asphyxiate to death. Russia is quick to respond with the use of low-yield tactical nuclear weapons inside NATO bases in Poland. President Putin claims these bases are legitimate targets, as it's thought here that the NATO and partner nations such as Japan and Australia have been resupplying the Ukrainian army. Thousands more die in the attacks, and NATO responds in kind. Just hours later, NATO nuclear weapons are striking bases along the Russian border, destroying troops, armored vehicles, aircraft, and thousands of tons of critical supplies badly needed by Russian forces inside Ukraine. For 12 hours, there is no reply, and the world breathes a sigh of relief. Perhaps this small exchange of tactical nuclear weapons is enough. Maybe a full-blown nuclear confrontation can be avoided. Those hopes are dashed, however, as 12 hours and 11 minutes after the first nuclear strikes inside Russia, Russia's nuclear forces unleash a small but deadly salvo against NATO's strongest member, the United States. The United States is approximately half an hour to react, but can the US rally defend the homeland from a nuclear attack? The first line of defense against nuclear weapons comes with detection, and for this task, the United States has been operating defense support program satellites for decades. The special satellites use very sensitive infrared sensors to detect the telltale infrared plume of a rocket launch, and they do it from a geosynchronous orbit, many thousands of miles above the Earth. Their unique orbit allows them to always face the same side of the Earth at all times, so they can remain vigilant 24-7 and have zero lapse in surveillance. Traditional satellites that orbit the Earth will only be able to observe one part of the Earth for a limited time and even constellations of satellites can produce coverage gaps over time. An added defense, the high altitude of DSP satellites make them difficult to destroy or interfere with from Earth, making them more resilient during a conflict. Defense support program satellites are aging, however, and currently being replaced with the new generation space-based infrared system, which builds on the core concepts of DSP and adds more robust capabilities, such as better resolution to detect the launch of even smaller, shorter-range missiles, and an increased resiliency against attempts to spoof, jam, or destroy them. Cybers Hygeo-1 was launched on May 7, 2011, and two other classified satellites believed to be a part of the program were also launched in 2006 and 2008. Further satellites have since been launched, giving the United States a robust early warning capability. Cybers Low was planned to be a constellation of 24 lower orbit satellites, meant to also track ballistic missiles, but with the ability to distinguish between warheads and decoys, a critical need if an incoming nuclear attack is to be stopped. The system would have had two major sensors, a scanning infrared sensor which would acquire ballistic missiles during the boost stage of flight, 
and a tracking infrared sensor which would follow the missiles and also track warheads, debris, and decoys. Cybers Glow was eventually absorbed into the Space Tracking and Surveillance System program, which aimed to test technologies for the tracking of missiles to aid in targeting. STSS proved to be very successful, tracking not just traditional ballistic missiles and their payloads, but even intermediate-range ballistic missiles which have a shorter flight time and are thus harder to track and target. In tests, the STSS program was successfully destroying intermediate-range ballistic missiles by guiding interceptors to their targets. The program further proved its capabilities on the 8th of July 2011 when it was tested against a short-range air-launched target, simulating a shorter-range air-launched cruise or similar missile. Since these missiles are already hoisted up high into the atmosphere, they're much smaller and dimmer as they require less powerful rockets burning for a shorter amount of time to get them to their target. In September 2021, the two satellites taking part in STSS testing were decommissioned and moved to higher orbits to prevent accidental collisions in the future with other objects in the same orbit. Since then, the US has been very secretive about any low-altitude missile tracking and targeting systems, but it's likely they're looking for more survivable options given the proliferation of anti-satellite weapons in the militaries of China and Russia. Once an incoming missile is tracked, targeting data can be fed to interceptor systems, and of those, the US has a few with varying rates of success. During the Cold War, President Ronald Reagan imagined a comprehensive anti-ballistic missile defense system that would make the United States safe from nuclear attack. Since then, attempts to implement successful missile defense systems have proven difficult. The main problem is that ballistic missiles are moving at thousands of miles an hour, giving any defenses very little time to react and even less time to launch a second set of countermeasures if the first fails. The second problem is the sheer altitude of an incoming ballistic missile. These missiles leave the atmosphere and cruise through space for the mid-course portion of their flight, meaning that any defense against ballistic missiles requires the ability to reach up and into space. This requires a missile of significant size if taking the traditional ballistic approach. Another option is laser weapons, but they're mostly ineffective due to atmospheric scattering and would instead need to be installed on satellites. Thanks to dispersal of the beam, though, these satellites would have to be fairly low in orbit, which means you would need a lot of them to maintain a constant screen of protection over the U.S. homeland. The next issue is actually hitting the missile itself. Our best option for missile defense is kinetic, meaning that the best method we have for destroying a nuclear ballistic missile is by using another missile. However, this requires two missiles moving at thousands of miles per hour to physically ram into each other. A ballistic missile is moving so fast that a traditional anti-air kill method such as fragmentation warheads that only require a missile get close to its target to shred it with shrapnel simply aren't effective. Plus, ballistic missiles are large, and once they're in their mid-course phase, simply shredding some critical systems isn't going to stop it from releasing its nuclear payload on your head. It's been described as hitting a bullet with another bullet, and requires math so precise it would make Einstein himself cry to sleep at night. Even the slightest miscalculation or a particularly strong gust of wind as the interceptor rises to the sky could be enough to spell a miss, and thus the US has developed some very powerful computers to guide interceptors to their targets. To be safe, though, an intercept attempt will typically involve multiple interceptors. But there's yet another hurdle in knocking out any incoming enemy ballistic missiles, decoys, and countermeasures. A modern missile is capable of carrying multiple warheads, but only some of these will be real. The rest will be dummy warheads meant to lure enemy interceptors. This means that it's best to intercept a missile before it has a chance to release its payload. But this is highly unlikely and requires missile defenses very close to the launch site. It's the entire reason that Russia has been so cautious about US missile defenses in Europe, and China has joined in after the deployment of US missile defenses to South Korea. With multiple decoys, an interceptor has to strike the correct target, or else you've just wasted a very expensive missile of your own and accomplished nothing. But ballistic missiles will also carry chaff to confuse radar tracking the incoming warheads, basically a cloud of highly radar-reflective material. It's unstealth technology meant to be as visible as possible and thus confuse radar, making targeting impossible. The best or worst part is that it's really cheap, too, basically costing only a few thousand dollars while defeating radars and computer systems costing tens of millions of dollars. So, how in the world does the US defend against a nuclear attack? The main defense against nuclear attacks on the homeland seeks to destroy the enemy missile during the mid-course phase. This is when the missile has entered space and is cruising along, making small adjustments and preparing to enter the atmosphere. This will be the largest portion of the missile's flight path, depending on how far away the target is. To knock enemy missiles out of space, the US has developed the ground-based mid-course defense system. 
these large missiles are designed to fly into space and smack head-on to an enemy missile, using a dummy kinetic kill warhead to smash the enemy missile into dust. The system consists of approximately 60 interceptors deployed in two bases, one in Fort Greeley, Alaska, and one in Vandenberg Space Force Base, California. A third site was proposed to be based in Poland, but Russia got extremely upset over it and was eventually cancelled. This geographic dispersal allows GMD missiles to knock out threats coming from Europe, which would be traveling over the North Pole, and threats from Asia or the Pacific. If you're wondering how the system defends against missile launches from enemy submarines close to shore, it doesn't. And you better hope that on that day the US Navy's on the ball and hunting down hostile subs. The GMD system is made up of six main subsystems. The first is the Exo-Atmospheric Kill Vehicle. This consists of a solid metal 140-pound interceptor fitted with various maneuvering thrusters. These thrusters wouldn't help the kill vehicle accelerate, but are instead there to help the interceptor make course adjustments and hit its target with pinpoint accuracy. The Exo-Atmospheric Kill Vehicle was meant to be replaced with a redesigned kill vehicle in 2025, but the contract was cancelled due to serious design problems detected by the Department of Defense. A replacement will have to wait until the next generation interceptor program begins to mature. Next is the Boost Vehicle, the massive rocket that carries the interceptor up into space. This comes with its own missile silo and silo interface vault all located underground. The Battle Management Command, Control, and Communication System, or BMC-3, helps guide the missile to its target by feeding it targeting data and ensuring uninterrupted communications with the interceptor and boost vehicle. Ground-based radar, space-based early warning radars, and forward-based X-band radars all make up the final subsystems of the GMD program. These veritable fleet of radars are all designed to provide high-resolution data during various phases of an incoming missile's flight, and their capabilities are classified at the highest levels. It's thought that these highly sensitive radar systems are so capable that they can detect aliens farting inside their UFOs, and they need to be if they're going to have any chance of hitting an incoming ballistic missile with another missile. GMD's effectiveness has been a subject of much contention, especially since it's cost the US billions of dollars. To date, the system has a success rate of about 55%, and critics are quick to point out that none of these tests have been carried out against dummy targets using a full suite of countermeasures. In reality, one could expect a success rate much, much lower than 55%. Luckily, the US has additional layers of protection against nuclear missiles. In response to Russia's anger over the proposed deployment of a missile shield in Poland, the US shifted focus to the development of the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System. This system is split into two components. The ABMD is designed to destroy short- to intermediate-range ballistic missiles while they're still in the atmosphere, either on ascent if close enough to a launch site, or more likely on descent. Aegis BMD, also known as sea-based mid-course, is designed to intercept ballistic missiles during their flight through space, and thus is capable of targeting missiles of any range. The origin of this program is in the mid-1980s with President Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, the much-vaunted attempt at creating a shield against any missile threat. Initially, SDI called for space-based railguns, but 40 years on and railgun technology is far from mature, with the US Navy canceling its own railgun cannon project. A new system known as Lightweight Exoatmospheric Projectile, or LEAP, was developed and testing began in conjunction with the sophisticated Aegis system. LEAP would eventually lead to several successful tests against ballistic missile targets and become Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense, using the standard Missile 3 to pulverize a ballistic missile. The first Block 1 system was delivered in October 2004, and an Aegis 3.0 update delivered in 2005. The world's best air defense system had just gotten the capability to knock ballistic missiles out of the sky. Aegis BMD would prove so successful that Aegis Ashore was developed as a land-based component, with a NATO Aegis Ashore ballistic missile defense system site being built in Romania and in Poland. On May 21, 2014, Aegis Ashore successfully detected, tracked, and destroyed a ballistic missile target. Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense, whether ashore or at sea, uses the RIM-161 Standard Missile 3 for mid-course interceptions and the RIM-156 Standard Extended Range Block 4 for the terminal phase interceptions. An interceptor is launched from a vertical launch cell and guided to its target by its home ship or Aegis Ashore facility, and then it collides with an enemy missile with over 130 megajoules of kinetic energy, requiring no explosive charge. Interceptions inside of the atmosphere or during the terminal phase of an attack carry blast fragmentation warheads. Since the reentry vehicle of a missile is much smaller than the larger ballistic missile body, 
that needs to be destroyed during the mid-course in order to neutralize the threat. The benefit of Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense when mounted on ships is that ships are mobile and thus can be quickly repositioned to defend likely target areas or be closer to a likely launch site, as it's better to target a ballistic missile as early as possible to avoid it deploying countermeasures. The ability to reposition your ballistic missile defenses is greatly valued by the US Navy, as is the ability to help cover facilities or locations that might be left vulnerable either because no other defenses exist or because mid-course defenses have failed. A terminal phase interceptor fired from an Aegis-equipped ship might be the last-ditch effort that saves your city from nuclear annihilation. The US, Japan, Romania, and Poland all have Aegis Ashore facilities, and the US Navy has five Ticonderoga-class cruisers and 28 Arleigh Burke-class destroyers equipped with ballistic missile defense capabilities. These ships are split up, with 17 assigned to the Pacific Fleet and 16 to the Atlantic Fleet. Future shipbuilding plans, however, call for 80 to 97 total ships to be equipped with ballistic missile defense capabilities within the next 30 years. This is driven not just from fears of nuclear attack, but by the necessity of protecting the US Navy from China's ever-evolving anti-ship ballistic missiles. China's missiles represent a serious threat to America and could push the US Navy out of the South Pacific for good if not countered. The US has also helped Japan equip four of its ships with ballistic missile defense capabilities, and this number is also expected to rise in response to the development of North Korean nuclear weapons and the Chinese threat. The next layer of protection for the United States is the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, or THAAD as it's also known. It was first proposed in 1987 as a mobile ballistic missile defense system. At the time, the problem with ballistic missile defenses was that they were vulnerable to conventional attack as their locations were well known. Adding mobility not only increased survivability, but also allowed the US Army to move them to locations where no other ballistic missile defense capabilities existed. At first, THAAD failed miserably, scoring only two successful intercepts out of eight tests. However, as the technology matured, the success rate increased to nearly 100%, though again the system has been criticized for not tackling realistic threats, making full use of dummies and countermeasures. This hasn't stopped the system from being exported to US bases around the world, and even for use with partner nations such as Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, where it's intercepted a Houthi ballistic missile in 2022, South Korea, Romania, and Israel. That works much the same way as any other terminal phase defense system. Its powerful ANTPY-2 X-band radar tracks the target as it flies through space, and once it's plotted where and when the target will re-enter the atmosphere, it launches an interceptor. The interceptor is then guided to the target by the radar, where it uses a kinetic warhead to smash the incoming missile to pieces. That is believed to be so effective that China has complained about its deployment to South Korea, despite US assurances that its goal is to protect the nation from North Korean nuclear weapons. Next, the US has one final line of defense for ballistic missile intercepts, the US Army Patriot Missile Defense Battery. Originally, the Patriot system was meant to take on airborne threats, but as the threat grew to include cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, the system was evolved to allow it to destroy these faster, nimbler targets. As a replacement to the Nike Hercules system, the Patriot is now the US Army's only line of defense against airborne targets. The Patriot's main appeal is its ease of setup, requiring less than an hour to prepare for operation. All of its components, including fire control, which itself includes radar, engagement control station, antenna mast group, and electric power plant, and the launchers are all truck or trailer mounted, giving them great mobility. The Patriot uses an AMMPQ-53 and AMMPQ-65 passively electronically scanned array radars, which are faster and more efficient than older mechanically scanning arrays like the type you've probably seen deployed on Russian vehicles inside Ukraine. The AN-MPQ-65 radar features a second traveling wave tube, which amplifies the radar's signal and gives it more power to track and detect hostile threats. Unlike similar SAM units, the Patriot uses only a single unit to search, identify, track, and engage targets, while other systems use multiple radars to do the same job. The Patriot's radar beam is very narrow in comparison with traditional radar dishes. This, however, allows it to focus more energy in a smaller space, which in turn allows it to better detect and track small, very agile, and high-speed targets such as missiles. The radar also has increased effectiveness against stealth aircraft, and the focused beam is very resistant to attempts to jam it or interfere with its operation. If the system detects it's being jammed, it quickly changes frequencies to avoid the jamming signal, repeating as necessary to provide good data to intercepting missiles. Patriot missiles work much the same way as any other terminal phase defense system by launching a missile on an intercept course with an incoming target. This is a short-range defense only, though, and it can only protect a small geographic location 
and only during the terminal phase of a ballistic missile's flight. In essence, Patriot batteries are the last line of defense when all of their options have failed. The current state of U.S. ballistic missile defenses leaves some serious doubts as to whether protecting from a nuclear attack is realistically feasible. To date, successful intercepts have been carried out under very controlled conditions, and there's a lot of reason to doubt that any of these systems would be able to defeat a modern ballistic missile equipped with a full host of countermeasures. Even if capable of doing so, each intercept would require multiple salvos of interceptors for redundancy, which means that even with the full complement of U.S. ballistic missile defenses operating at peak efficiency, only small pockets of the U.S. homeland could be offered some measure of protection in the case of an all-out nuclear war. Compared with the ballistic missile defense capabilities of other nations, though, this might be all that's needed for the United States to survive as a nation, and to do so in far better state than any of its potential adversaries. To be truthful, though, that's not saying much, as the global consequences of a full nuclear exchange will likely trigger human extinction anyway. This brings up the question of if ballistic missile defense is even worth it, especially considering the extreme cost. To try to improve ballistic missile defense in the future, the U.S. is already looking at new technologies. During the 2000s, the U.S. experimented with an airborne laser concept, essentially just a Boeing 747 equipped with a massive laser on its nose. The airborne laser solved many of the problems of ballistic missile defense, namely the difficulty in guiding a kill vehicle to its target when both it and the target are flying at hypersonic speeds and over great distances. The airborne laser could instead target a missile during its most vulnerable phase, the boost phase, and destroy it at the speed of light. In multiple tests, the airborne laser successfully destroyed ballistic missiles and other airborne targets. However, ultimately the project was scrapped in 2010 due to numerous problems. First, the laser was only effective at very short ranges due to atmospheric scattering. So as Secretary of Defense Robert Gates stated, if the laser was to be used to intercept missiles from Iran, it would have to be orbiting inside of Iran's national borders to do so. Secondly, in order to successfully defend against ballistic missile threats from a single hostile country, a fleet of 10 to 20 of the aircraft would be required at a cost of $1.5 billion each, and costing $100 million a year to operate. The airborne laser was officially dead, but the data gained from testing has been invaluable in developing other directed energy weapons. In fact, the concept of an airborne laser has now been once again resurrected, only this time with the laser mounted on very high-altitude unmanned drones. These drones would fly at altitudes far in excess of large jet aircraft, such as the original test platform, and at such heights would maintain laser beam integrity over longer ranges. An unmanned drone flying at 65,000 feet would be able to engage targets as far away as hundreds of kilometers, and a fleet of smaller unmanned drones would be cheaper to procure and operate. They also could fly for very long periods of time through airborne refueling. As technology improves, we might once again see the return of the cancelled airborne laser program, albeit in a much different form than predicted by its original builders. It's even possible that these lasers could be installed on low-Earth satellites, and this would in fact be the most efficient method of ballistic missile defense. However, doing so would prompt other nations to begin arming their own satellites and create a space weapons race. Inevitably, in order to protect from space-based interception, nuclear weapons would be logically moved to space themselves, where they could be dropped straight down onto targets below, making most forms of interception impossible or mostly useless. But as it stands today, while the US could probably successfully defend from an attack by a rogue state such as North Korea, there's a little hope of surviving even a moderate exchange of nuclear weapons after hundreds of billions spent in ballistic missile defense. The Earth goes through periodic cooling periods known as ice ages, with the last ice age ending a few tens of thousands of years ago. Today, we're resting comfortably in the middle of a mild climate period, which means moderate winters in most places around the world, and year-long sunshine in California. But today, we're also capable of changing the environment artificially, and are already doing so via uncontrolled release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which are warming the planet. But with thousands of nuclear weapons around the world primed to detonate, that warming trend could very quickly reverse and send us straight into a man-made ice age. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're asking, how can we survive a nuclear winter? The legendary astrophysicist Carl Sagan co-authored a paper in the 1980s called Climate and Smoke, an Appraisal of Nuclear Winter. In this earth-shattering essay, Sagan and his partner James B. Pollock studied the physical effects a nuclear war would have on our planet, and discovered that not only would such a war devastate nations, but it could potentially disrupt the global climate. 
By vaporizing debris and filling the atmosphere with ash, soot, and aerosols, a nuclear war would result in global dust clouds that would block the sun's rays for years, preventing the sun's energy from reaching the surface of the planet. This would trigger a cascade cooling effect, which would plummet global temperatures by as much as 22 degrees Celsius, turning sunny California into something more akin to blustery Seattle. The world would enter an artificial ice age. Though recent studies have shown that Sagan and Pollock's original estimates may have been a bit overzealous, our environment is incredibly fragile, and even a 10 degree drop in temperature would have dramatic repercussions. Not only would lower temperatures severely shorten growing seasons for crops, but all of that blocked sunlight would send weather and ocean current patterns that help keep the world mild today into disarray. The North Atlantic Drift is an ocean current that brings warm water heated by the sun in the equator to northern Europe, which in turn is why Europe is so far north yet enjoys mild weather and warm summers. With a decline in sunshine, this current will completely shut down, and without warm water being circulated around Europe and into the Mediterranean, Europe would begin to see weather close to what is common in Canada today. Spain and France's famous summertime beach destinations would be a thing of the past, and in fact, pretty much the entire Mediterranean would be far too chilly to go for a swim in. But it wouldn't be just sunny beaches that are a casualty of the nuclear winter. The North Atlantic Drift also helps bring favorable weather for growing crops to Europe, and without it, Europe would experience a catastrophic crop collapse during what little growing season may be left due to all the dust in the atmosphere. The east coast of the US is also dependent on ocean currents for its mild weather, and a global cooling that reached the equator would shut down the Gulf Stream along the US's shores. Originating in the Gulf of of Mexico, the Gulf Stream circulates warm water up along the east coast of the US and into southern Canada, helping bring mild temperatures to the area during spring and summer. Chilly temperatures would be hard enough to deal with, but all of that blocked sunlight would also shorten growing seasons for crops. With much reduced sunlight, humanity would be unable to grow enough crops to feed everyone alive today, and mass starvation would ensue. If current stockpiles of non-perishable goods could be evenly and fairly distributed, a doubtful circumstance in a post-apocalyptic world, it's possible that the majority of the population could survive a short-term nuclear winter. The length and severity of a nuclear winter would ultimately depend on the amount of weapons exchanged between combatants. But even a small regional exchange of just a few hundred low-yield weapons is estimated to plunge the Earth into a 10-year nuclear winter. Even with today's large stockpiles of non-perishable goods, there's simply no way the majority of the population could survive a decade of famine. Those that do survive, however, would face crippling vitamin and mineral deficiencies, leading to disease and illness which would further decimate humanity's plunging population. In the midst of a nuclear winter, you'd probably be delighted to see a few shafts of sunlight through clouds full of choking dust. But beware, that sunlight could be lethal. That's because a nuclear war would destroy the ozone layer, meaning there would be little protection from the sun's harmful UV rays. Unless you slather up in the most powerful sunscreen you can find, basking in the sun for too long will result in severe sunburns and cancers. Your eyes would be especially sensitive to that intense UV radiation, and it would be vital to wear goggles or sunglasses with UV filters in order to keep yourself from going blind. Because UV rays can damage your eyes without you feeling it, your vision could become severely impaired without you realizing what is happening until it's too late. A nuclear winter would be clearly a nightmare scenario, but it might be survivable. After all, your ancestors already did. That's right, we're the descendant of a very small group of humans who have survived an ancient nuclear winter. 75,000 years ago, a supervolcano in modern-day Lake Toba, Sumatra erupted with a fury equivalent to thousands of nuclear bombs and was 100 times greater than the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora, which resulted in 1816's year without a summer. Injecting 6 billion tons of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, the eruption dropped global temperatures by 3 to 5 degrees Celsius for three years, and further cooling lasted lasting decades. Though scientists differ on the severity of the cooling, the Toba super eruption is widely credited with the creating a genetic bottleneck in human evolution, during which the human population dropped suddenly to a surviving population of only about 3,000 to 10,000 individuals. So though a nuclear winter sounds bad, know that you are already genetically predisposed to survive one. But how exactly can you help your odds of survival? First, you'll want to tackle your greatest threat 
the cold. Insulating your home will be critical to keeping warm. And if you don't know anything about insulation or construction, now is a good time to learn at least how to use spray foam insulation materials. Fuel supplies will run critically low very quickly, and even trees may become scarce if there's not enough sunlight for them to grow. You're going to want to keep out as much cold as possible, while keeping in as much heat as you can at all times. Secondly, you'll want to secure a fresh water drinking supply. A nuclear winter may paradoxically not necessarily result in snow, as disrupted weather patterns and a lack of evaporation and thus precipitation may turn the world into a frozen desert. Even if there is snow where you are though, it's likely to be highly contaminated with radioactive or other particles from the trillions of tons of debris ejected into the atmosphere by the nuclear bombs. Emergency water filters will be critical for your health, as well as water purification tablets and possibly iodine pills for radiation poisoning. It goes without saying that intense radiation will also be a hazard, but you are in fact not very likely to be irradiated in a nuclear winter to stay out of ground zero blast zones. That's because a nuclear weapon is designed to air burst or explode several hundred to a few thousand meters above its target. This is because if the bomb were to explode on the ground, the blast wave would be mitigated by terrain and buildings, severely limiting the explosive potential of a nuclear bomb. High up in the air though, a blast wave can spread for several several miles without being dampened by the hilly terrain or dense clusters of buildings. An airburst detonation will also ensure that the majority of the radiation from an explosion will actually be projected upwards into space, while a ground burst detonation will irradiate millions of tons of soil, which will be carried by the wind. So stay out of large craters and you shouldn't be turning into a fallout-style ghoul anytime soon. Your third concern will be to secure a food supply. This may be trickier than finding water or keeping water as even perishable goods will quickly become scarce. And with most nuclear weapons aimed at major manufacturing and distribution centers, it's unlikely you'll find much that will be safe to scavenge without irradiating yourself. Hunting and fishing may seem a viable alternative, but the world operates on a complex food web with organisms feeding on each other, and at the very bottom of that food web sits the sun. It doesn't matter if you're a polar bear or an Antarctic leopard seal. The food you eat inevitably eats food that in turn eats something that grows thanks to the sun. Polar bears, for instance, hunt seals, who in turn hunt small fish, who in turn feed on krill or plankton which depend on the sun. Global food chains will collapse inevitably, but with a severely diminished population, you just might be able to eke out enough hunting and fishing to survive. If not, well, there's always billions of freshly barbecued human bodies lying around. A nuclear winter would decimate civilization and possibly drive humanity to the brink of extinction, but this isn't a threat we haven't faced before. As the Toba supervolcano showed us, we as a species have what it takes to survive and thrive in the face of any disaster, and with these catastrophes acting as genetic bottlenecks, our children will be even more capable of surviving whatever the future throws at them. On the 8th of November in 2017, American Secret Service agents and their Chinese counterparts were involved in a brief altercation over the American nuclear football while entering China's Great Hall of the People. A Chinese agent blocked President Trump's aide, tasked with carrying the football, only for Chief of Staff and retired U.S. Marine Corps General John Kelly to announce, we're moving in, and brush past the Chinese guards. A guard grabbed Kelly, who quickly quickly shoved the guard off, and immediately a U.S. Secret Service agent tackled and subdued the Chinese guard. Though the scuffle was over in a flash, it highlighted the importance of this little black briefcase that must always accompany the president no matter where he goes. But just what is inside of that top secret briefcase? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics Show. Today we're asking, what is the nuclear football? The head of the Chinese security detail would go on to apologize for the misunderstanding, as apparently the guards had not realized that the aide carrying the nuclear football must always be within easy reach of the US president. While some might think the American response was an overreaction, it only takes a moment to see it from the Secret Service's point of view, to see why they felt the need to respond immediately and with overwhelming force. The US president had just been removed from the nuclear football while in a foreign nation, and a nation to boot who is a potential nuclear adversary, were something to happen to the U.S. president while he was away from the football and China launched a preemptive first strike against the U.S., there would be no way for America to respond in time with its own weapons. A far-fetched scenario to some, but U.S. Secret Service agents must constantly entertain the most extreme possibilities as potential realities every single day, for that is the only way to avert a potential and surprise catastrophe. Thus, it's a standard operating procedure that the nuclear football never be removed from the immediate physical vicinity of the U.S. 
US president. So just what does the nuclear football do exactly, and what's inside of it? This nuclear command and control tool is officially known as the President's Emergency Satchel and is an aluminum briefcase encased in black leather. Details are difficult to ascertain given the extreme secrecy of the device, but it is widely believed to be bulletproof and resistant to explosive damage. It weighs approximately 45 pounds and is equipped with powerful satellite communication gear to ensure the President is always in contact with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. As nuclear arsenals grew in the Soviet Union and the US, it became clear that the nation to launch first would have an immediate and possibly war-winning advantage. Such a first strike might even render the defending nation unable to launch its own nuclear counterattack, making the possibility of a nuclear first strike extremely attractive to the aggressor. With ICBMs moving at thousands of miles an hour, it became vital that the President of the United States be able to order an immediate nuclear counterattack in the case of a sudden war. Yet, after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the President John F. Kennedy posed several questions to his staff, doubting the effectiveness of the current nuclear command system. His most pointed question, however, was, how would the person who received my instructions verify them? This one question led to a complete rethinking of how the US President was to order a nuclear attack or retaliation, and highlighted a major flaw in the system set in place for the President to do so while out of the White House. Thus, the modern iteration of the nuclear football was born. A mobile device, the nuclear football, contains satellite communications gear that lets the president be in contact with the Joint Chiefs of Staff no matter where in the world he is. It also contains four individual items. The Black Book, as it is known, contains all retaliatory options available to the president. This can include a full-scale nuclear response against one or all of America's enemies, or a limited response which might be just a single cruise missile strike with a low-yield warhead. It's rumored that attack plans also include an option to launch a no-harm nuclear strike high above a nation in the atmosphere, delivering an electromagnetic pulse that wipes out most of a nation's electrical infrastructure. If you're a fan of conspiracy theories, it might also include a plan to nuke the reptilian aliens hiding out in the dark side of the moon. A second book contains a listing of classified presidential nuclear shelter locations, or places that the president could be taken to in case of a major nuclear emergency. These are typically hardened locations deep underground that can survive direct nuclear strikes. A manila folder with 8 or 10 pages that give a description of the procedures to initiate and use the emergency alert system, both for early warning and for post-strike communications with the nation. Lastly, a 3 by 5 inch card with printed authentication codes. These codes ensure to the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the person ordering a nuclear attack is indeed the US President. And while they typically stay within the football, some US Presidents, such as President Reagan, actually preferred to physically carry his cards in his pocket. During the assassination attempt against against Reagan when he was rushed to the hospital. Not only was he physically separated from the football, but as his clothes were cut off in surgery, the nuclear codes were haphazardly discarded by medical staff and later found stuck in his shoe. But just how does the football actually work? And what process would the president have to undergo to launch a nuclear strike or retaliate against one? Firstly, only the current president of the United States is authorized to launch any form of nuclear attack, whether that's as retaliation or an escalation during the middle of a full-blown war. Should the president president be incapacitated or killed, that responsibility falls to the vice president, and so on down an established chain of command. Second, the president is patched into a conference call with his top civilian and military advisors, whom all recommend a course to follow. If enemy launches are detected, this call can last as short as 30 seconds. Communications between the president, his advisors, and top military leadership are all relayed via the US's Milstar Satellite Network, a highly jam-resistant constellation of satellites that keeps US forces linked together around the world. As a redundancy or in the aftermath of a nuclear attack, US military forces could still use the the Takamo Airborne Communication System to stay in contact basically a fleet of airplanes packed with communications gear that is also extremely resilient to jamming. The Takamo communication system was designed to keep a nation ravaged by nuclear war in contact with its military forces around the world. Once an attack plan has been decided on by the president, the senior officer in the Pentagon war room must authenticate the president's identity by issuing a challenge code using the military alphabet, such as Charlie November. The president then references his authentication codes card, known as the Biscuit, and reads the appropriate response 
response. An emergency war order is then broadcast to all US nuclear alert forces via several communications networks. To ensure receipt, the order is typically about 150 characters, or the length of a Twitter message, and contains the specific war plan to execute, launch time, and authentication codes needed to unlock the missiles before firing. Seconds later, crews around the world based in missile silos, alert hangars, and submarines deep underwater all open locked safes which contain sealed authentication systems, or SAS codes, which are prepped by the National Security Agency. They compare their SAS codes with those contained within the launch order to verify the authenticity of the launch order. Any discrepancies whatsoever will result in a no-go or no-launch release of nuclear weapons. When launched from a submarine, the captain, executive officer, and two other senior officers authenticate the order. About 15 minutes later, the missiles are ready for launch. Land-launched ICBMs are housed in underground silos with five launch crews each controlling up to 50 missiles. Each launch crew is made up of two officers and the individual teams are housed miles apart from each other in highly secure underground complexes to ensure their security. Each team receives their orders and compares their SAS codes with those sent by the war room. Once authenticated, the crews enter the war plan number into their launch computers, which retargets the missiles from their peacetime targets in the middle of the ocean to their wartime targets on land. At the designated launch time, the crews all turn their launch keys simultaneously, which sends five votes for launch to the missiles. Because the missiles need just two votes for launch, failure to authenticate or mutiny by three other crews will not stop the launch of all 50 missiles. Missiles launched from airborne platforms follow a similar method, with their individual SAS codes being verified against those sent by the war room. During the Cold War, the US and Russia both kept nuclear alert forces in the air at all times, 24-7, 365 days a year, and these crews would then immediately proceed on a vector to their assigned targets. Once SAS codes are authorized, missiles are immediately fired. Anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes after a presidential order is given, intercontinental ballistic missiles will be blasting off into the sky to rain death down on their assigned targets. And once released, there is no way to recall them, disarm them, or reprogram their trajectories. The responsibility of carrying the nuclear football is staggering, as is the responsibility of the man entrusted by the US to use it properly. While many have criticized the entire system, and one senior American general was even discharged for asking, how do I know the president giving me the order to fire my weapons is sane? It remains the best system for ensuring continued nuclear deterrence. Disclaimer: All of the stories featured in this episode of The Infographic Show come from actual military service members or other government officials, many of them vetted by independent researchers and local or national media outlets. It was late on a chilly February morning, 2007. At approximately 02.30 hours, a security patrol stationed inside the nuclear weapon storage area of Nellis Air Force Base, otherwise known as Area 2, called into Central Security Control, a sighting of what appeared to be vehicle headlights far outside the outer perimeter fence a mile or two in the distance. This wasn't uncommon as Area 2 was detached from Nellis Air Force Base, and everything from hikers to off-road enthusiasts would inadvertently stumble upon the little-known facility in the desert. Following standard procedure, the two outer security patrols, Oscars 1 and 2, were dispatched to assume overwatch positions on the reported headlights. Their job, as it often was in these dark desert nights, was to simply observe, and if the civilian vehicle approached too close to the facility perimeter, intercept it and have them turn around. As the two outer security patrols arrived atop the tall bluffs overlooking the reported sighting area, they spotted and confirmed what appeared to be two vehicle headlights approaching down the side of a nearby mountain. Inside of the nuclear weapons storage area, two additional patrols had moved close to the section of the fence the vehicle headlights were approaching, along with the site security supervisor, Security 1. A grand total of 11 Air Force security personnel were watching when suddenly the lights disappeared. Fearing that the oncoming off-road vehicle had turned off its headlights so as not to be tracked, Oscar 1 left its position on the bluffs and moved to an intercept position along the incoming vehicle's estimated avenue of approach. The site's security controller requested the assistance of a main base K-9 unit which had happened to be in the area, and the two patrols linked up, leaving their vehicles behind moved out to the desert to set up an LPOP, or listening post observation post. The desert, though, was quiet. Despite the incoming vehicle having been within two miles of the fence line, there was no sound of a revving engine across the still dark desert. Scans with both thermal imagers and night vision goggles revealed nothing. 
And then suddenly, the radio came to life. Patrols on the interior of the nuclear weapons depot began calling in lights on either side of the dismounted Oscar 1 and K-9 patrol. From their vantage point atop the tall igloo-style weapon bunkers, they could see a series of lights appear in the 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 3 o'clock of the dismounted patrolmen. Incredibly though, the three men and one dog on the ground could see nor hear anything. Then the site security supervisor came on the radio. Oscar 1, be advised, the lights are moving on you. The three mysterious lights, seen only by interior patrols, suddenly rushed the dismounted patrolman. The senior patrol leader ordered his partner and the K-9 patrolman to lock and load. With lights approaching their position on the desert floor at high speed, he was taking no chances. As far as he was concerned, the mysterious and now aggressive behavior of the lights indicated hostile intent. What happened next depends on which side of the fence line you happen to have been on. For the three patrolmen and one dog on the outside of the fence line, nothing happened. The three men held their breath, M4s at the ready, and nervously scanned the desert with thermals and night vision but spotted nothing. They even checked with the dog, who was trained to indicate if it sensed danger and yet nothing. After a few minutes, the patrol leader called back in over the radio to ask for an update on the lights but received nothing but static. Trying a second and then third radio, the exterior patrols got no reply and slowly walked back to their vehicles to attempt to make contact with the interior patrols again. On the inside of the fence though, at least two dozen security forces patrolmen, including the master sergeant security supervisor, had seen the lights converge on the location of the dismounted patrol and then simply disappear. Even more incredibly though, when the exterior patrolmen finally made contact with the interior patrols, they were told they'd been out of contact for 20 minutes. Yet each man involved in the incident on the outside of the fence line swore that only three or four minutes had passed for them. Where had the other 15 minutes of time all spent without radio contact gone? Things would only get weirder, though, before they got any better. This incident would prove to be only the opening act to some of the strangest events ever reported by US military personnel. And we can tell you about it in first person because, at the infographic show, we got a chance to sit down with one of the security forces patrolmen involved in these incidents. After the exterior light show incident, things started to get weird. I mean, there had always been weird things out in Area 2. We had everything from ghost stories to weird animal sightings. I'd probably think it was all BS or just tricks the dark plays on you, except a lot of this stuff was seen by numerous people at the same time or with the help of pretty advanced night vision and thermal imaging devices. What started happening after the lights incident, though, took the cherry in weird and outright dangerous. Within a week of the incident, one of the daytime exterior patrols ran across the corpse of a donkey, which wasn't that weird since there was no civilization around us and animals sometimes wandered out there. What was weird, though, was that this donkey had no head. It was cleanly cut off and there was some crusted blood around the neck, but there was no blood anywhere around the body on the ground. We ended up shrugging it off, figuring that somebody had butchered the animal just dumped it in the desert, completely unaware of how close they got to our facility in doing so. But then, just a few days later, another donkey corpse was found, and this one was missing its head and all four of its legs. Again, no vehicle tracks, no blood on the ground, just a decapitated legless donkey. The very next day after that, a third donkey was discovered by an exterior patrol, this time at night. This donkey was also missing its head and legs, but it had its stomach cut open with one clean incision, and the entire contents of the body cavity were gone. Once more, there was no blood on the desert floor and no vehicle tracks. We forgot about the donkeys after a while, and even though people kept reporting strange lights, nothing too dramatic happened until about six months later. What happened next took the cake and was almost a full-blown national nuclear security incident. We used to practice assaulting our own storage facilities just in case bad guys got in and tried to steal a nuke or just barricaded themselves so they could set off a nuke in place and irradiate large swaths of Nevada. One of those nights we underwent our usual exercise scenario, involving a response by multiple patrols and an assault into our designated training structure. All in all, somewhere around 17 to 18 people were involved. Most of the patrols were at the assault training structure, but we kept the patrol armed with an M249 machine gun on overwatch just to keep an eye on the desert behind us. Now, Area 2, the nuclear weapon storage depot, was huge, several square miles, so there was lots of empty desert inside the fence perimeter. As we were lining up to assault the training structure, we suddenly got a call over the radio from our overwatch patrol located on a hill about a quarter mile from us. The patrol said, hey, you got two figures lying prone in the desert behind you. We assumed this was part of the training exercise, so our on-scene commander redeployed a small element to secure our rear as the rest of the response force prepared to assault. However, our flight leader, or security supervisor, immediately came running up to us and told us to lock and load. He then called over the radio and told central security control to terminate the exercise. Then he turned to look at us and said, I didn't put anyone out in the desert. Whoever's out there is not us. 
Now, our security supervisor was in charge of running the exercises, and he would task random people with playing the bad guys. So when he told us that he hadn't put anyone out there, our blood ran cold. This was about as high a security area as you can get in the US military, home to dozens of nuclear weapons. Anyone who had somehow penetrated our security was not here to have a friendly chat. We immediately returned our magazines to our weapons and charged them, switching safeties off. Our Overwatch patrol had good eyes on the figures. One of the guys on that patrol was using a sensitive thermal camera, and the other was using night vision. That's the standard procedure for us since it gives you two vision modes to ID a target. According to them, the figures seemed to be laying on their bellies, watching us from about 100 meters behind, hiding behind a small berm. The desert out there was pitch black, so we got into a long line and formed a sweeping element. Two heavy gunners on Humvees watched our backs and got ready to light up anything that turned hostile as we started our sweep in the desert. As we approached, our Overwatch patrol warned us that the figures were crawling into new positions. They were actually reacting to our movements and trying to remain hidden. According to the two guys who could see them over night vision and the thermal unit, the figures appeared frantic as if panicking at having been discovered observing us. Yet they never stood up and stayed low on the ground on their bellies. For us, on the sweeping element, we couldn't see a thing, despite also using our own night vision goggles. However, the desert was thick with brush, so staying unseen would have been pretty easy for anyone laying low. We kept on moving forward, weapons at the ready, as our Overwatch patrol stayed in constant contact with us, letting us know what the figures were doing. Then, as we got within 25 meters, they just vanished. According to the Overwatch patrol, the two figures were there one moment and then completely disappeared the next. No flash of light, no sound, nothing, just disappeared. We rushed forward to the last known location and swept the area, finding nothing. Although one of our guys had brought his handheld thermal imager and was actually able to pick up traces of warmth on the desert floor. Somebody or something had in fact been laying on that floor, long enough to heat it up, watching us as we practice our assault techniques. That incident might have been bone chilling to hear about, definitely to have lived through, but it was far from the only incident involving possible UFOs or even aliens and nuclear weapons. Throughout the Cold War, the United States and even the Soviet Union had several extremely high profile incidents involving nuclear weapons and UFOs, and these incidents have been reported by individuals with extremely high levels of credibility. In 1977, unidentified flying objects not only proved that they could intrude on US airspace unimpeded, but that they might even have have full control over our nuclear weapons. As told by United States Air Force Technical Sergeant Thomas E. Johnson, who was a flight security supervisor at the time, one night a security alert team was dispatched in response to strange lights low in the sky. At the time, Johnson was stationed at a North Dakota missile field, home to dozens of Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles housed in underground silos, ready to fire on the Soviet Union at a moment's notice. As the team neared the reported area, they spotted lights in the sky ahead of them, varying in color. The lights would zoom from one location to another at impossible speeds, or other times would simply blink out in one location and blink in at another location. The security team leader said that he couldn't tell if they were multiple objects or just one incredibly fast object. Prior to the incident, the security personnel had been briefed by Air Force Office of Special Investigation Agents that unknown helicopters had been reported at other strategic air command bases. The Office of Special Investigation, or OSI, is like the Air Force's FBI, and the special briefings indicated that something very peculiar was going on at other US Air Force bases. Yet that night, the object, or objects, didn't move like helicopters and made no sound. What they did do, though, was far more terrifying. Directly under the lights, the missile launch officers responsible for launching the Minutemen in case of war reported that they lost control over some of the 10 missiles they were in charge of. One of the launch officers later said that they couldn't communicate with the missiles, and if they had needed the launch, they would have been unable to. Incredibly, though, this type of incident would be repeated numerous times throughout the Cold War, and sometimes the actual targeting codes programmed into each missile would be altered or completely erased. Each of these occurrences always happened in conjunction with sightings of UFOs. Are UFOs monitoring our nuclear weapon sites? Is it a coincidence that every major nuclear weapon or production facility in the United States has a long history of UFO sightings? For a growing number of people, the UFO interest in our nuclear weapons is very real, and the case was only strengthened when after the fall of the Soviet Union, former Soviet military and government officials revealed that their nuclear sites had also been host to UFO incidents. A column of Ukrainian armored vehicles accompanied by tanks approaches their ready positions, prepared for a fresh assault into the Russian defenses outside Kherson. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has been wildly successful, beyond even the scope of the most optimistic military planners. Russia can't hold the line against Ukrainian grit and firepower, and its troops are on steady retreat across the entire Eastern Front. 
On Friday, September 30th, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin had annexed four regions of Ukraine, declaring them Russian territory. This now allows him to use all available means at his disposal to neutralize the Ukrainian counterattack. Now, with his back against the wall, Vladimir Putin becomes the second person in history to order the use of nuclear weapons in war. A brilliant fireball lights up the night sky, incinerating the column of Ukrainian vehicles. Even inside their armored shells, the Ukrainian soldiers are killed instantly. Those who were far enough away to survive the heat and blast are killed by the radiation bombarding their bodies. Several hundred Ukrainian soldiers and a few dozen vehicles are destroyed. The attack has been largely insignificant in terms of military value. Ukrainian forces have mastered the tactic of dispersing and reuniting again for sudden offensives, but it sends a clear message to Ukraine and the rest of the world. Thousands of miles above the planet, a United States satellite, part of the American Space Surveillance Network, detects the distinct double flash of a nuclear explosion. The alarm is instantly relayed via communication satellites using the Secure Link 16 encrypted radio frequency system. Within 30 seconds of detection, the alarm has already reached a U.S. Space Force monitoring station in North America and similar offices around the NATO alliance. Minutes later, the alert reaches the desk of U.S. President Joe Biden. Picking up a secure phone, he dials a direct connection to General Mark A. Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the most powerful military officer on the planet. President Biden speaks only three words into the receiver, execute Plan 36. The coded order is relayed via U.S. communication satellite to Stuttgart, Germany, and the office of the commander of U.S. European Command, General Christopher G. Cavoli. Within minutes, the authenticated order is transmitted to U.S. forces in RAF Bentwaters and RAF Lakenheath inside England. A separate communique is dispatched to the USS supercarrier George H.W. Bush, currently stationed in the Mediterranean. The Bush is loitering in waters off the southern coast of Turkey, and the ship immediately turns into the wind as its flight deck erupts in a flurry of activity. Ever since Putin's threats of using nuclear weapons, the American military has been prepared to respond. Beneath the deck of the bush, F-18 Super Hornets are having AIM-160 MALDs attached to wing hardpoints. Each Hornet can carry two of the large weapons, a capability kept secret from the world until now. Two squadrons of the high-performance aircraft are quickly made ready and begin the journey the flight deck above where they stand ready. In England, crews rush to man a fleet of eight B-52 Stratofortress bombers. The big planes are the backbone of the U.S. bomber fleet and can bring a frighteningly large amount of firepower to bear thousands of miles away. Joining them are four B-2 bombers also kept on alert status, their crews ready to go at a moment's notice with bellies full of weapons. Within 15 minutes, the first planes are taking to the sky and turning southeast toward mainland Europe. Two hours later, the bomber fleet links up with two squadrons of U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptors, taking off from bases in Germany. The Raptors are flying in stealth configuration, which means their wing pylons are clean of weapons. The internal weapons bay, however, is loaded with six AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and two AIM-9 short-range missiles in the side bays. The formation continues toward the Black Sea, the F-22s leading the way. An hour later, the F-22s link up with a loitering U.S. Air Force tanker aircraft in order to top off their fuel stores. The B-52s loiter as the F-22s refuel. With enough capacity to fly strike missions in Europe from their home bases in America, the B-52s have no need to refuel. As the F-22s refuel, NATO AWACS aircraft flying along the Ukrainian and Turkish coasts sweep the skies with their powerful radar, looking for any potential hostile targets that could pose a problem for the mission. The aircraft's powerful radar only has a range just above 250 miles, so they can only see across approximately half of the Black Sea. Soon, they'll move for a closer look, but in order to maintain the element of surprise, the AWACS stick to their normal flight pattern instituted at start of the Ukraine war. The F-22's refueling, however, is the signal for the USS Bush to begin launching her Super Hornets. One by one, the high-performance strike fighters take to the sky, their compatriots wheeling in the skies above the carrier strike group and waiting until both squadrons have taken to the air. Then the planes split into two groups, taking similar but distinct routes north and into Turkish airspace. One route will take the group west of Ankara, while another will take the other group over Sivas. An hour later, both squadrons pivot northeast, heading straight for the Black Sea. The B-52s, B-2s, and F-22s have now reached the Black Sea. The United States' operation to punish Russia for its use of nuclear weapons is a go. The B-2s take the lead now. The entire formation has turned south and then east again, which will allow it to skirt Crimea by 70 or so miles, well out of the effective range of Russian air defenses in the region. The target is Novorossiysk and the Russian naval base located there. After the sinking of the Moskva, the Russian Black Sea Fleet has moved its largest surface combat vessels here in order to keep them out of range of Western anti-ship weapons provided to Ukraine. The AWACS aircraft have shattered the formation, sweeping the skies with their powerful long-range radar. The job is to look for enemy fighters. 
thus allowing the accompanying F-22s to operate without their own search radars on, ensuring their stealth. However, the powerful radar is being picked up by Russian sensors in Crimea. The Russians now know that an attack is coming. NATO hasn't deviated in any significant way from its pre-announced patrol routes for months, and the only reason an AWACS aircraft could be approaching Russian shores is if it's backing up a major air attack. It's not long before the AWACS planes pick up the signature of multiple Russian fighters taking to the skies. The data is relayed via data link to the Raptors, who stand ready to greet the Russian challengers. It's now time for the Super Hornets to do their part. Skirting along the very edge of Russian long-range radar, the Hornets fire off their MALDs one by one. In minutes, 40 of the big missiles are screaming straight at mainland Russia. But the weapons aren't bombs. The miniature air launch decoy is an advanced drone that can perfectly replicate the radar return of nearly any aircraft in NATO's arsenal. Currently, the decoys are spoofing Russian radar returns to convince them a flight of B-52 bombers is incoming from the direction of Turkey, escorted by F-18s. This is a credible threat. The US maintains multiple air bases in one of NATO's most geographically strategic allies. Payloads away, the Hornets turn around and head for the the bush. Russian long-range air defense radar in Crimea has spotted the real B-52s, but the appearance of a flight of B-52s escorted by F-18s incoming from Turkey is a more pressing threat. Russian ground crews have been scrambling to put three squadrons of interceptors into the air. Now a squadron consisting of a combination of MiG-29s and MiG-31s are wheeling south from air bases in Crimea and the Russian mainland. The jets are in full afterburner mode which consumes fuel at a frightening rate but pushes them to supersonic speeds. They must get to within 70 nautical miles of the incoming B-52s so they can intercept them with their long-range air-to-air missiles. The R-77-1s, NATO codename Adder, are inferior in range to their American AIM-120 counterparts, with only a range of 68 miles. This is roughly the range of the expected harpoons carried by the American B-52s, who have a range of around 75 nautical miles. Russia always doubted the US would respond with its own nukes, and this only left one possible target for American vengeance, the Russian Black Sea Fleet. An alert reaches the Russian vessels and waters just off of Novorossiysk. The fleet currently consists of the guided missile frigates Ladny, Admiral Essen, and Admiral Makarov, which has taken the role of fleet flagship after the loss of the Moskva. Landing ships Nikolai Filchenkov, Orsk, Azov, Novocherkask, Cesar Kunikov, and Yamal are all at dock. The smaller guided missile corvettes Vyshny Volaychok, Samum, Ingushetia, and Gravuron take up stations around the frigates. This is the bulk of the Russian Black Sea Fleet currently in operation, with a few vessels on duty in the Mediterranean. US Navy submarines and F-15 Strike Eagles from Europe are already en route to destroy them. The entire fleet turns with their noses parallel to the incoming threat. This will allow each ship's SeaWiz systems maximum opportunity to engage any missiles that penetrate long-range air defenses. S-300 and S-400 batteries along Russia's eastern Black Sea coast open fire on the incoming decoys. The decoys are easily within the 242-mile range of both systems for targets with a radar return as large as a B-52. The number of incomings is overwhelming. This is a major American air assault, and the air defense batteries expend most of their missiles. The vessels of the Black Sea Fleet opt to let the shore units do their work and focus on defending against any aircraft or missiles which slip past. American B-2 stealth bombers open up with AGM-158 CLRASM anti-ship missiles, the planned replacement for the Harpoon. The US military still operates only a small number of the weapons and only recently adapted them for use with a B-2. Each of the four B-2s unleash a volley of 16 of these low-observable anti-ship missiles, and Russian radar screens light up as they detect the 64 incoming missiles. The attack is a complete surprise, and the missiles are moving so fast that shore-based air defense batteries have no chance of catching the missiles before they reach their targets. The fleet is on its own to defend against the attack. But the LRASM's low observable features is making the missiles difficult to target. To make matters worse, their missiles now dive toward the ocean, flying just above the water as they scream toward their targets. The missiles are within several dozen nautical miles before Russian radars can not just detect them, but target them. The Russian ships immediately fire off decoys. These immediately begin to fire off electronic signals meant to be more powerful than those emitted by real vessels, thus luring in anti-ship missiles to strike them instead. However, the American missiles are built with optical target recognition systems, ensuring that the weapons can tell the difference between decoys and the real thing. At just over three dozen miles, the Russian radars finally can target the LRASMs, and the frigates are the first to open up with long-range surface-to-air missiles. It's like trying to hit a speeding bullet with another bullet, and the LRASMs can be difficult to target. Of the 64 incoming missiles, 16 are struck and destroyed. With just miles left to go, the corvettes open up with short-range Komar missiles. These missiles have a much smaller warhead, 
but several manage to strike true. Another eight LRASMs are knocked out of action. The American weapons now enter the terminal attack phase and suddenly pitch up, climbing high into the sky. More Russian anti-air missiles fly out to try to swat them out of the air. Another six LRASMs turn to fiery wrecks. Each missile identifies its own target, prioritizing the larger frigates. The sky fills with tungsten from the frigate Seawiz systems. Ten more LRASMs are destroyed before striking true, but 22 find their targets. The 1,000-pound warheads slam into the Russian frigates. The Admiral Essen takes ten of the missiles. She's already destroyed by the time the last three slam into her, but the missiles aren't smart enough to identify lethal battle damage. The Ladny only takes two and remains afloat with moderate damage. Admiral Makarov takes six LRASMs to the deck. The rest of the weapons either strike the smaller corvettes or explode in the water, missing their targets. Only two of the Russian frigates remain alive, along with three of the corvettes. Two Russian ships are quickly sinking below the waves. The attacking P-2s turn around and head for home, visible on Russian radar only for a moment as each bomber opened its bay doors. To the south of the fleet, the Russian interceptors are now in range to engage the MALDs and open up with R-77 missiles, ripple firing at the incoming formation. Each missile will find its own target, and with such a dense concentration of forces, should have no problem striking true. The Russian fighters are rapidly turning and burning for home, fully aware that American AIM-160s have a longer range than them. The lead Hornet should have opened fire by now, yet strangely no incoming missile threats are detected on radar. Reporting this to ground control, Russian commanders are beginning to grow suspicious. A second wave of interceptors is redirected west toward the incoming flight of eight B-52s. This happens to put them directly on course to intercept the B-2s, who are slow and vulnerable. In full afterburner, the Russian fighters will soon be in range of not just detection, but targeting of the stealthy aircraft. Right now, their focus are the big American bombers, who are completely vulnerable and helpless. Radar detects no accompanying fighters, which makes the Russian pilots very nervous. There are only two possibilities here. The eight B-52s are actually decoys, and the main attack is the 40 aircraft formation to the south, or the attack from the south is the decoy, and this is the real thing. If the latter is the case, there can only be one reason why radar isn't detecting any accompanying fighters. The US has put its F-35s or F-22s into the fight. The intercepting fighters get their answer shortly after entering the Black Sea. The F-22s have skirted out into the Black Sea and away from the shore, keeping out of range of shore-based radar which can detect them within 100 or so miles. The Russian interceptors have even weaker radar and can only begin to pick up traces of the stealth fighters within 50 or so miles, but can only get good targeting locks from a few dozen miles away. The F-22s turn on their own targeting radar long enough to get a solid lock on the incoming Russian MiGs. On their radars, the Russians detect only a brief blip, as each F-22 rapidly volley fires their AIM-120Ds. The AIM-120Ds have a classified range, easily in excess of 100 nautical miles, and the MiGs don't even get to within range of the B-52s before they're forced to take evasive actions from the incoming missiles. Each missile has flown high into the sky immediately after firing, and now plummets down on the Russian fighters. Each pilot tries to notch the incoming missile but most of them strike true. The surviving fighters are forced to turn around at full afterburner, but the Raptors already have loosed another volley of aims at them to encourage them to retreat. The only way to defeat the American stealth fighters is to overwhelm them with numbers and absorb their long-range missile attacks. Once at close range, the Raptors would have been at a disadvantage. But the Hornet-launched decoys fooled the Russians into splitting their forces. With the skies free of enemy fighters, the B-52s are safe to get within 75 nautical miles of the surviving Russian vessels and loose their harpoons. 96 anti-ship missiles are soon screaming toward the Russian ships. The frigates immediately respond with their long-range air defense missiles. The harpoons are far older technology and don't have the same low observability features of the LRASM. Long-range air defense managed to take out 20 of the incoming missiles as the harpoons get within a dozen miles of the ships. Then the corvettes open up with their shorter-range missiles. Each ship is rapidly volley-firing their entire missile stock, knowing their lives depend on it. 20 more of the harpoons are knocked out before they get into range of the fleet Sea Whiz. Tungsten once more fills the sky as a wall of lead rises up to greet the incoming missiles. 22 more harpoons are knocked out, either by missiles or Sea Whiz. Decoys manage to lure away a dozen or so of the harpoons, but 22 of the surviving missiles strike true. The 500-pound warheads smash into the corvettes and frigates, most of which have already been damaged by the LRASMs. Despite having half the warheads of the previous rocket volley, the blitz of missiles is lethal. As the B-52s head for home, Russia sends up more interceptors to take on the flight of MALDs to the south. The decoys are easily blown out of the sky by air and ground-based defenses, but all that does is expend precious resources Russia can no longer easily replenish. 
Their job is done. They succeeded in diverting Russian attention south and splitting up its interceptors. The Russian Black Sea Fleet has been destroyed. All that remains is four submarines which Russia doesn't dare put to sea for fear of being targeted and a complement of landing and support craft. The surface combat vessels were the important targets, and Russia suffered an irreplaceable loss. In the span of an hour, it went from the dominant military power in the Black Sea to the weakest. Blockades of Ukrainian ports are no longer possible, and Russia has been punished for its use of nuclear weapons with the loss of hundreds of sailors and billions of dollars in hardware. What remains to be seen is if the deterrent has been effective or if President Vladimir Putin will resort to even greater use of nuclear weapons as retaliation. If so, the United States stands ready with its allies to respond with either conventional or nuclear power. In the spring of 1945, an embattled Japan was gearing up to shock the USA with a nightmarish fighting tactic. In Europe, a desperate Adolf Hitler was going insane in his bunker. Meanwhile, in the USA, the president had very hard decisions to make. Does he sign off on dropping weapons of mass destruction on Japan? Weapons which his chief of staff said were so barbarous they showed an ethical standard of barbarians from the Dark Ages? It was not an easy decision to make, which we think you'll agree with by the time you got to the end of this show. That spring, the Japanese finally had been beaten in Burma, but the country was in no way done in the Pacific. Japan would not concede defeat, and never mind what it took, it would fight to the bitter end. As March came to a close, the US forces had secured the island of Iwo Jima, but not without considerable loss of life. To capture this tiny island, no bigger than a third of Manhattan, 7,184 American soldiers died, and another 24,000 US soldiers were injured. The Americans were now entirely superior to the Japanese in almost all military capacities. As the war historian Max Hastings notes, at this point Japan was suffering death from a thousand cuts. He also said that while Japan's defeat was assured, the country's military leaders would not accept that. What Japan's generals wanted was for the war to end on their terms, which seems ridiculous given the weak position they were in. But they had an idea. Make sure that for everything gained by the US, there would be massive blood loss. Show the Americans that they would have to fight tooth and nail, and if a land invasion of the Japanese mainland should happen, let the Americans know that it'll cost lots and lots of American lives. As you'll see, the very sincere stubbornness led to one of the most controversial military tactics of all time. With this plan in mind, Japan struck quickly, mounting a series of devastating air attacks on the US Navy. It wouldn't be enough, however, and soon after, Major General Curtis LeMay issued the command to strike Tokyo. 325 bombers flew low over the city, dropping so many bombs in such quick succession the place resembled flaming hell. Only 12 of those bombers didn't come back, but that was only because they were caught in the updrafts from the fires. Such success was uncommon. An American soldier said Tokyo looked like Dante's Inferno. He wrote back home saying fires were everywhere, and the destruction brought this night could have been nothing less than catastrophic. 100,000 Japanese residents were killed in the Tokyo bombing, and about a million people lost their homes, and around a million suffering injuries. Then, American B-29 bombers hit other cities, causing mass destruction and death in places such as Osaka and Kobe. Japanese planes couldn't stop the attacks. It was an absolute massacre. Then, the Japanese used their dark ace in the hole. They used pilots to fly their planes into American planes and ships. Yeah, you've heard of this tactic. They were called kamikaze pilots, a word which in Japanese means the divine wind. That's what the pilots thought they were doing, acting as divine agents to save their homeland from the not-so-divine Americans. Many of these pilots volunteered, but many others were reluctant to fly to their deaths. Some barely had any flying experience and were just out of high school. One such young man said, we have to go to the battlefield to die without being able to express our opinions, criticize, and argue. To die at the demand of the nation. I have no intention whatsoever to praise it. It is a great tragedy. Japanese cities had already been reduced to ash. Millions upon millions of people had been injured and displaced. The air raids may have killed 400,000, but some estimates say 900,000. As for military deaths during those bombing campaigns, one American soldier died for every 100 Japanese. By May, Hitler had already expired in his bunker, along with his new wife and his beloved mutt, Blondie. Germany was done, and the Soviets were doing their very worst in those cities to the surviving civilian population. But the Japanese would not give up. Once they started using kamikaze pilots, their success rates improved, despite how awful this form of fighting was. When the US invaded Okinawa, the Japanese hit back with these pilots, and suddenly the US Navy started taking a hammering. The US public, seeing the war in Europe was over, didn't like hearing that American boys were going up in flames. Those kamikaze pilots were doing so much more damage because they rarely missed their target. It also helped that because those planes were destined for destruction, they could be stripped down of parts and not fully filled with precious fuel. The executive officer of the USS Essex, Fitzhugh Lee, said some of his boys were in a state of wild panic because of the Japanese one-way missions. Those minutes would seem like years he said about seeing the blip in the sky coming toward the ship. We had a few 
who lost control of themselves and started weeping, crying, praying, Lee said. All of this is very important when you try to understand why the US dropped these two atomic bombs on Japan. One Japanese kamikaze pilot wrote to his mom, proud of what he was going to do. He said, I will do a splendid job sinking an enemy aircraft carrier. Do brag about it. His name was Hayashi Ichizo, and indeed, that was his last letter. He died off of Okinawa at just 23 years old. Other such pilots stated in letters that they would defeat the Americans and the British and they would die with pride doing it. How do you beat such a force of will? 27 American ships were sunk during the time, which was devastating for the US. If a Japanese pilot set off on a mission, he had a 20% chance of hitting his target and causing massive damage to man and machine. This tactic was 10 times more destructive than regular attacks. On June 22nd, the Americans were reported over 7,000 Army and Marines dead, plus another 5,000 Navy personnel dead. Over 50,000 soldiers were injured, some very seriously. Japan was having success, so the generals still believed this could force the US to bring agreeable terms to the table. Little did those generals know what was in store for them. As they made plans to send more men to certain death, British scientists who'd been ahead in the atomic bomb-making department had already joined the Manhattan Project in America. The atomic bomb was ready to go, but oh god, dropping that thing was an ethical conundrum. One of those scientists, Edward Teller, wrote to a colleague, saying, I have no hope of clearing my conscience. The things we're working on are so terrible that no amount of protesting or fiddling with politics will save our souls. But US planes pretty much crippled Japanese industry. There were hardly any more industrial targets to destroy. Now it was just about killing civilians, women, children, old folks. Some people who didn't agree with the war, who hated war. But if you think for a minute that even with that kind of carnage, Japan was going to back down, you'd be very wrong. During all this chaos and the loss of life and industry, here's what Chief of General Staff Yoshijiro Yumeza said in a newspaper story in May. The sure path to victory in a decisive battle lies in uniting the resources of the empire and getting behind the war effort, and in mobilizing the full strength of the nation, both physical and spiritual, to annihilate the American invaders. No doubt, many people in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki read that, and likely many of them read those words with a sense of pride, determination, and hope. They could have no idea what was coming to them. Murderous weapons, cynically named Fat Man and little boy. Weapons that would cause more destruction than they thought possible in their wildest nightmares. Still, many of them may have picked up one of the 63 million leaflets the Americans dropped over Japan, saying things like, we cannot promise that only these cities will be among those attacked. They just didn't know how they were going to be attacked. Not many people knew just how destructive those bombs were. A British commander of the Sefton, named Michael Bloybrook, wrote, just after the bombing, we heard about some wonder bomb that had been dropped on Japan, which was going to stop the war. We really took no notice, thinking that one single bomb wasn't going to alter the course of history. That's the thing, not many people knew how deadly these things were. The Japanese certainly didn't know what was around the corner. In terms of the ethics of dropping bombs, many people now ask why at least didn't the Americans send an explicit threat? Still, would those Japanese generals have backed down? You already know just how intransigent they were. To them, many Japanese soldiers and to many people in Japan, they were still fighting that divine war. It's likely they'd have ensured that war went on and on in spite of the massive loss of Japanese life. If that had happened, and back home in America, report after report would have detailed depressing statistics about the loss of American lives. In early August, a 19-year-old American gunner named Joseph Majeski was on the Pacific island of Tinian when he saw the delivery of a B-29 bomber named Enola Gay. He noticed that it had been modified, so he asked what the purpose of it was and why it was in Tinian. A crew member looked him in the eye and said, matter-of-factly, we're here to win the war. The first bomb, Little Boy, was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th and Fat Man hit Nagasaki three days later. Had the Japanese not surrendered on August 15th, a third bomb would likely have been dropped on Tokyo. But the devastation caused to Japan was so great that even those incorrigible generals had to accept defeat. Some Japanese soldiers remarked that they could never imagine such a thing, but those bombs were also something they could have never imagined. Somewhere between 129,000 and 226,000 died in both cities, with as many as 240,000 people dying later from the effects of the bombs. The vast majority of casualties were of course civilians. As awful as that was, when the US estimated what damage would be caused if an attempted a land invasion, it said 400,000 to 800,000 Allied soldiers, American and British, would likely die. It's also believed such an invasion would cost the lives of 5 to 10 million Japanese. Now we need to talk about a man named Joseph Stalin, the well-read murderous maniac that ruled the Soviet Union. He was actually one of Time Magazine's Men of the Year long before he became an enemy of the USA. Good old Stalin. 
fighting the Germans. But if you read any biography about Stalin, you can see that he had hopes of communism spreading all over the world with Russia at the head of things. In fact, he had hoped at the start of the war that powerful nations would be weakened by the fighting and he would clean up later. As you know, that didn't happen because Adolf Hitler had his own ideas about world domination, and those jet black precious thoughts of his included getting rid of the darn commies. Stalin's Red Army invaded Japanese controlled Manchuria on August 9th, the same day as the second atomic bomb dropped. Japan had in past hoped Stalin would not turn against it. The two countries had signed a pact in 1941, but after the Yalta and Tehran conferences, Stalin promised the Brits and Americans that once Germany had fallen, he'd help beat Japan. This apparently came as a bit of a shock to the Japanese generals, who had hoped in 1945 that the Soviets would help broker peace with reasonable terms with the Allies. So even if Japan had carried on fighting with the Americans and then the British and pretty much been devastated, there would have also been the Soviets to deal with. Japan would have been fighting on so many fronts and things would have gone really bad for the country. So, had those bombs not dropped, you could have expected extreme loss of life. The Americans would have lost many more men too. We don't want to sound in support of the use of nuclear weapons. Those things being used on Japan was a sad indictment of the human race. But when the Japanese generals said they would fight to the death, we think they were not blowing hot air. On the very day the bomb hit Nagasaki, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Imperial Japanese Army, Toroshiro Kawabe wrote, to continue fighting will mean death, but to make peace with the enemy will mean ruin. But we have no choice but to seek life in death, with the determination to have the entire Japanese people perish with the homeland as their deathbed pillow by continuing to fight. We think there is no doubt then that the Americans and the Brits would have gone through with the land invasion called Operation Downfall, and a downfall it would have been for Japan, as you already know, but with considerable loss of life for the Allies too. The US knew only too well from experience that Japanese fighters were willing to walk to certain death, and that the country had a fanatically hostile population. Meanwhile, Stalin's army might have marched farther and possibly taken the entire peninsula of Korea. Some historians think the entirety of Korea would have ended up communist and possibly also a bit of Japan. The Americans and the British, knowing the consequences, would have started a beef with Stalin. So the world would have looked like a different place. You also have to realize that the USA would still have had those bombs, and later the Soviets and then the British. There wouldn't have been a taboo about them, no horrid photos of their destruction. So you have to ask if they'd have been used later, maybe in Vietnam, maybe as a result of Cold War. It doesn't bear thinking about what would have happened if they'd been used during those panic-stricken, paranoid years of the Cold War. As we said, it was a sad and shameful thing that happened to Japan, but what could have happened later might have been worse in terms of loss of life. And anyway, as we've shown you, the land invasion of Japan would have been its own kind of horror. It's a controversial thing to say, but perhaps it was the right thing to do, especially looking in hindsight. But obviously, the best thing that could have happened is that Japan had surrendered earlier, possibly after Truman had done the right thing and fully explained what was coming. Sure, leaflets said prompt and utter destruction was on the way but Japan just thought that was already in the cards with all the normal bombs. We'll leave the last words to the historian Max Hastings, whose brilliant research helped us write this show. Almost all of those who participated, nations and individuals alike, made moral compromises. It is impossible to dignify the struggle as an unalloyed contest between good and evil, or rationally celebrate an experience or even an outcome which imposed so much misery on so many. Amen. Nuclear Armageddon for years it haunted the daily lives of millions of Americans and Russians, only to be all but forgotten at the end of the Cold War. But with hostilities mounting once more between the US and Russia, and the announcement of a possible pullout from a strategic arms treaty by the US, the old specter of nuclear war is once more looming over a new generation. But how much do you really know about nuclear weapons? Hello and welcome to another episode of The Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at 50 terrifying facts about nuclear weapons. 50. The largest nuclear weapon in the U.S. stockpile has a yield of 1.2 megatons, or 1,200,000 tons of TNT. 49. Compare that with the 15 kiloton, or 15,000 tons of TNT equivalent of Little Boy, dropped on Hiroshima during World War II. 48. Most of the uranium used in the Little Boy and Fat Man nuclear bombs came from a single mine in what is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, shipped to the US by a Belgian mining firm. 47. Three different manufacturing plants were used in developing the Fat Man and Little Boy nuclear weapons, so that no one plant would have the complete designs. 
46. Because if exposed to water, the uranium components of the first nuclear bombs would release huge amounts of radioactive contamination, pilots were strictly warned that in emergencies they must crash their planes on land and not the sea. 45. In the Little Boy bomb, less than a kilogram of the 64 kilograms of enriched uranium actually underwent nuclear fission, and of that mass only 0.6 grams were transformed into kinetic and heat energy and radiation. 44. A timer on the first nuclear bombs ensured that they would not detonate until at least 15 seconds after release, giving the aircraft time to get to a relatively safe distance. 43. The chain reaction of nuclear material leading to a nuclear detonation lasts less than one microsecond. 42. Disobeying orders, the weaponeer of the Enola Gay was concerned that Little Boy could detonate accidentally if the Enola Gay crashed on takeoff and thus removed the conventional explosives to help the uranium achieve critical mass from the weapon. He only replaced them once the aircraft was safely up in the air and on her way to Hiroshima. 41. At 8.15 a.m. on the 6th of August 1945, the Enola Gay dropped the first nuclear weapon ever used in war on Hiroshima, killing 66,000 people, 20,000 of which were Imperial Japanese Army soldiers. 40. Claimed to have been used to avert a more catastrophic invasion of Japan, it's widely thought Japan would have surrendered to the US soon anyways, as it faced a massive Soviet fleet preparing to invade just across the Sea of Japan. Senior Japanese officials all knew it would be better to surrender to the US than the Soviet Union. 39. Hiroshima was selected as a target for nuclear bombing in April 1945 and spared the conventional bombing that Japan suffered throughout the rest of the countryside. This was so that the effects of a nuclear bomb on an undamaged city could be fully observed. 38. A second plane escorted the Enola Gay and dropped a suite of instruments by parachute at the same time that the Little Boy atomic bomb was dropped. These instruments relayed via radio data to help engineers determine the total yield and effectiveness of the bomb. 37. The fiery blast from a nuclear bomb is the result of local air being superheated by X-rays and sending out a pressure wave in all directions. 36. The fireball from the Hiroshima bombing was 1,200 feet in diameter and had a surface temperature of 10,830 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than the surface temperature of the sun. 35. Shadows from people near the epicenter of the blast at Hiroshima were permanently burned into the sides of buildings and the pavement. 34. The Hiroshima bombing created a firestorm two miles in diameter. At Nagasaki, a southwest wind pushed fires away from the city and didn't let them become so severe. 33. The true death count of victims at Nagasaki and Hiroshima were impossible to calculate, as many victims and all evidence they had ever lived were immediately vaporized or cremated by the fires. 32. Surprisingly, there was little radioactive fallout from either the Nagasaki or Hiroshima blasts. Fallout is typically created from dust and ash from a bomb crater that is contaminated with radioactive products from the bomb. But because both bombs were air bursts, there was no bomb crater and little radioactive fallout. 31. When a nuclear bomb is air bursted over a target, the vast majority of the radioactive products rise into the stratosphere and dissipate into the global environment. 30. Despite there being little if any local fallout, an intense burst of neutron and gamma radiation was emitted by the little boy in Hiroshima bombs, with a lethal radius of about 0.8 miles. 29. To date, no radiation-related evidence of heritable diseases has been observed amongst the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. 28. The Smithsonian Institution displayed a complete little boy nuclear bomb, minus the enriched uranium, until 1986, when the Department of Energy took the weapon from the museum to remove its inner components so that it couldn't be stolen and detonated with fissile materials inside it. Its outer casing was later returned for display. 27. The first detonation of a nuclear weapon in history was at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945, in New Mexico. 26. Producing the fissile isotopes uranium-235 and plutonium-239 for use in just a few bombs was so difficult that it took up 80% of the entire Manhattan Project's budget. 25. Without the technological breakthroughs of the Manhattan Project, producing just one gram of enriched uranium would have taken 27,000 years. Maybe it would have been best if they had failed. 24. The security detail at the Trinity test site where the first atomic bomb was tested originally brought horses to help patrol the vast desert, but the distances proved too great and instead resorted to jeeps. The horses were kept so the soldiers could play polo when off duty. 23. 
The base camp at the Trinity test site was accidentally bombed twice because of its proximity to a bombing range and its secrecy, but with no casualties. 22. The scientists at the Trinity test site worked out of a ranch house that had been bought by the government when it acquired the land. The master bedroom of the house was then turned into a clean room for assembly of the core of the first nuclear bomb. In that bedroom, at least, is literally where the boom boom happened. 21. 160 men in their vehicles were on standby outside the first atomic test in order to evacuate the surrounding region of civilians should disaster happen. The soldiers had enough food and supplies to last the civilian population two days, and the governor of New Mexico was warned that martial law may have to be declared, though he wasn't told why. 20. The men at the test site were ordered to lie on the ground with their backs turned to the bomb during the test, but scientist Edward Teller ignored this and wore sunglasses under his welding goggles and brought suntan lotion to share with a few others who also insisted on observing the test directly. 19. Scientist Enrico Fermi offered to take wagers among the military and scientists on whether the test would ignite the atmosphere, and if it did, whether it would destroy only the state or incinerate the entire planet. This was a joke, but calculations indicated there was a tiny chance that such a scenario could happen, and for a long time it seriously concerned all the scientists involved. 18. The Trinity test bomb melted desert sand around it into a mildly radioactive light green glass, which would be named Trinitite. 17. Keith Bainbridge, one of the scientists of the Manhattan Project, said just after the successful test, now we are all sons of bitches. Robert Oppenheimer, head of the project, said that he thought of a verse from the Hindu holy book, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 16. A pilot flying a U.S. Navy transport to the west coast and just north of the test site thought for a moment that the sun was rising in the south when the bomb detonated. He had no idea what he had just seen, and when he reported the explosion over the radio, he was simply warned not to fly south. 15. The government covered up the Trinity test by telling civilians in the vicinity that what they had witnessed was just a depot full of explosives and pyrotechnics accidentally exploding. 14. The results of the Trinity test were relayed in code immediately to President Truman, who was at the Potsdam Conference in Germany, with the message reading, Operated on this morning, diagnosis not yet complete, but results seem satisfactory and already exceed expectations. Local press release necessary as interest extends great distance. 13. In August of 1945, the Kodak company discovered spotting and fogging on their film caused by exposure to radioactive elements. The problem was tracked to the cardboard used in the containers, which came from a paper mill in Indiana and a hotspot of fallout that had contaminated the river water the mill used. 12. In 1951, the U.S. government gave Kodak and other photographic companies maps and forecasts of potential contamination, along with expected fallout distributions, so they could purchase uncontaminated materials for their boxes and protect their stocks of film. 11. In 1961, a U.S. Air Force B-52 broke up in mid-air over Goldsboro, North Carolina, and released two hydrogen bombs. Neither detonated upon hitting the ground, but if they had, each one would have had 260 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. 10. Colorado, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Wyoming are home to the U.S.'s entire ICBM fleet, which lie in missile fields that span several square miles each. 9. In the 1950s, the U.S. developed a tactical nuclear weapon which weighed 51 pounds and could be fired from the back of a jeep. It was named the Davy Crockett and was meant to be used against Soviet tank forces in Germany. 8. Just 8 kilograms of plutonium are needed for a nuclear weapon, something many intelligence and security agencies around the world fear is well within the reach of major terror groups. 7. 11 nuclear bombs have been lost by the U.S. in accidents and never recovered, all of them in the ocean. 6. If under nuclear attack, the U.S. president would have just 12 minutes to order a counterattack before incoming missiles destroyed the bulk of U.S. forces. 5. At any one time, 12 Ohio-class ballistic missiles are actively patrolling the world's oceans, ready to unleash their nuclear arsenals in the case of war. 4. The United States protects 31 nations with its nuclear umbrella, all of NATO, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. A nuclear attack against any of these nations will elicit an immediate response by the U.S. 3. The U.S. maintains 200 B-61 nuclear gravity bombs deployed at forward bases in Europe for use by U.S. and NATO air forces. 2. During the Cold War, the U.S. maintained up to 950 nuclear weapons in South Korea. 1. 
Since 1945, there have been 520 atmospheric nuclear explosions, with eight of them being underwater, for a total yield of 545 megatons and 1,352 underground explosions for a total yield of 90 megatons. Many of us have been lucky enough to grow up without Cold War fears of a nuclear holocaust happening at any moment. And though the international climate today is far better than it was back then, simmering hostilities are threatening to boil over. To add to our problems, the advancement of technology and the proliferation of enrichment technology around the world has made it easier than ever for a terrorist group or criminal organization to simply build their own nuclear weapon. Though full nuclear war may be avoided, the risk of nuclear terrorism is at an all-time high, prompting a famous reply from the US intelligence community that it's a wonder it hasn't happened yet. Do you think the world will see another nuclear attack, either in war or by terrorists? Let us know in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.